Good morning and welcome everyone to the 17th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, no apologies have been received, so hopefully we'll have a full house shortly. Uh, and we move to agenda item one, which is alcohol licensing in Scotland. And the committee will hold a round table evidence session on the number of large and the number of interested stakeholders to explore the ability of communities to engage with and influence alcohol licensing decisions in their areas. Can I, can I welcome everyone here today? We've got a, a lot of witnesses here today. And perhaps we might start off by going around the table and just and maybe just introducing yourself and see what organisation you're from. And the MSPs can introduce themselves as well. So I'll, I'll start off. I'm Bob Doris, MSP, the convener of the committee. Hey, I'm Laura Mahon. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of Alcohol Focus Scotland. Good morning, I'm Monica Lennon, MSP, and I'm the Deputy Convener of the Committee. Good morning, I'm Mary Miller, I'm Clark at Glasgow Licensing Board. Andy Whiteman, MSP. I'm Fiona Stewart, I'm the Deputy Clerk to the North Aberdeenshire Licensing Board. Graham Simpson, MSP, um, and I sat on a licensing board for 10 years when I was a councillor. Uh, John Shearer, President, Licensed Trade Association. Stuart Wilson, and I'm Chair of the Licensing Forum for East Ayrshire. Good morning, Alison Kennedy, uh, Police Scotland, and from Safer Communities. Good morning, Jenny Goldruth, MSP. Hello, I'm Roger Colkett from Talkhouse Community Council. Hello, I'm Alexander Stewart, MSP, and I sat on licensing board for my 18 years as a councillor. Good morning, I'm Susan Elliott, and I'm the Scottish Borders Licensing Forum member. I'm John Lee from the Scottish Crossers Federation. Okay, can I thank everyone for coming along? And I should, of course, say that we've also got, uh, to my left, official report researchers and clerks who are really vital in pulling the, this kind of event together. So uh, just uh, give my thanks to them before we open up. I'll maybe start with just a, a very general question to, to get to get discussions going. Um, we've got two representatives from local licensing forums here. And one of the things we want to establish as a committee is, and I, I mean this with absolute respect, what is it licensing forums actually do? Um, is it consistent what they do in different parts of the country? Indeed, and we did our call for evidence. We didn't get a reply back from every part of the country in relation to licensing forums. And uh, two areas come back to us and said, well, they don't exist in our country. And it's a statutory duty to seek to establish them. Uh, and I understand every area is doing that. So we're quite keen to hear, you know, what's happening in practice where they do exist that's going well, um, what's not going so well, and why is it patchy in different parts of the country? So I, I don't know who would want to start off in, in, in relation to that. I'm happy to start off. Thanks, Susan. Susan Elliott. <clears throat> so I'm from Scottish Borders Licensing Forum, and as you're aware, the licensing forums came in on board when the new legislation came in place. Um, I'm probably one of the fortunate members that have been around since the start. So at that time, there was training provided for licensing forums, and the role of the forum is really to oversee and scrutinise the licensing boards and the operation of the Act in their area. But it's very difficult because members are coming on board, and at the start we had training, but since then there's no training, so there's no national guidance, if you like, for licensing forums. The guidance that was provided at the time was all about the setting up of the forums, and since then there's been no guidance. So as a core member, I'm able to hold the focus of the forum um, along with the LSO and, and the good relationships that we have there. Um, but it is a real challenge, I feel, for forums um, in keeping up to date with legislation and regulations and keeping their knowledge base ongoing. So locally we have developed some, um, we did a survey of our licensing forums to look at the focus and make sure we had a shared understanding around our role. And from then we worked with Alcohol Focus Scotland and we had some training developed, uh, which was rolled out. And we opened that up to the licensing board as well because we're all about the same thing, about making sure that we have safe environments, so it makes sense to have joint CPD training as well. Okay, thank you. Stuart Wilson, I don't know if you want to, to add to that. Yeah, I echo a lot uh, what the previous speaker has said. Um, I've been around the forum probably for around 10 years, and there has always been a big difficulty in attracting young people almost impossible to get young people represented, and that's a very important target audience. Uh, we in East Ayrshire have a very good working relationship 
with the board. Uh, there's no tensions between us at all. Um, the LSOs have a crucial role to play in it. The, the LSOs, and there are two in East Ayrshire who are very, very helpful both to the trade um, and to the board and to the forum. Um, we issued a questionnaire to the 32 authorities in Scotland um, about their views on the forum and a national body. Uh, like yourself, Chair, um, we found it hard to get responses from some authorities. We got 20 odd replies from the 32 authorities, 18 of whom were very keen on some kind of national coordination for the forums and national sharing of good practice, training, all of these things. Okay. See, just before we move out, Laura, man, I'll take you in a second, but can I just get for on the record for where they are working? I mean, I could just see what I think they do. What is it they're doing? We've, we've identified what the problems and the challenges are, but could you say a little bit of what you're actually doing? The, in the Scottish Borders, a lot of our work is taken up in terms of developing al an alcohol profile, so the evidence base, so gathering data from health, police, um, as well as some of the national statistics to pull into a, a resource that licensing boards can use when they're making their decisions so that it's evidence-based and they also consider that in their licensing policy statements. So that's quite a big piece of work that the forum's involved in. Um, and we've also had engagement from our communities through using the likes of social media and Facebook to gather some views from the communities to build into that profile. Okay, thanks. Stuart, do you want to add anything to that before I bring up? Well, what our main meat, I suppose, is what the legislation says. We oversee the actions of the board. We receive in advance the agendas for board meetings. We look at the, uh, the applications. But we're restricted a wee bit because the legislation says we cannot comment on individual applications. So we can only address the board on very broad issues. At the moment, we're fairly heavily involved in the creation of the, the policy, the board policy for the next five years. Um, so that's that's the main thrust of the We, we have had several presentations from Alcohol Focus, and again, they've proved very helpful. Um, lack of trainings, a problem, and I know you, you didn't want to focus on the negative, but there is, when someone comes on to the board, they're starting from quite a low level, and there's a need for some kind of training. The board members all require training. You can walk onto a forum, unless you tell me otherwise, with no background whatsoever. That's very helpful. Laura, do you want to come? Yeah, I, I think just to echo what um, Stuart and Susan are saying, AFS's role with regards to licensing as a whole is to try and have a, a, a national overview of, of how the system is operating and licensing forums and the function of licensing forums has been a concern for us for some time now because of the inconsistency and I think as Susan has highlighted where you have long-standing members that have been there right from the start and received the early training they can co provide a bit of um, continuity and understanding for new people but there are other forums and it the fact that you didn't receive responses from some areas is of no surprise to me at all because we have tried several times to try and do a kind of information gathering exercise to identify what the needs are and it's really difficult to get a picture across the country because in some cases there isn't a forum there in other cases there aren't any paid members of staff providing support to that forum and i think from our point of view where forums are functioning well, it tends to be where the local authority has invested quite a lot of staff resource and other resources to, to help them and keep them up to date and to uh, help them engage in some areas that's just not there. Okay. Any other witnesses want to add to their experience of local licensing forums? Thank you very much for your Stuart. We have just disbanded our three existing divisional licensing forums in Aberdeenshire. To explain, we have three divisional boards, so when the Act came on board, we set up a forum for each board area. 
and we were struggling to have members turn up. They were struggling to develop strategies and actions to follow. So Aberdeenshire Council disbanded it in January this year and set up a brand new licensing forum to cover the whole of Aberdeenshire. It's had one meeting. Um, I delivered the training because, as has been said, there is no training for forum members. And they're actually meeting today uh, to start looking at what their strategy is going to be, to be action focused and to start considering what they need to do in terms of our licensing policy review. So we are doing our best to keep them on track, but the three previous ones, they just kind of fell into a rut. They didn't know where they were going, what they were doing. And we also found that the, the police, the LSOs, were having to deliver to three agencies um, rather than the one, and it was a waste of resources for some of our partners. Sorry, so we're trying to streamline it a just lot. My apologies for terminology. LSOs? Licensing Standards Officers, my thank, apologies, thank, Chair. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure the rest of the MSPs knew that, but I'll, I'll, I'm happy to publicise my ignorance in, in relation to it. I don't believe you, Mr Simpson. Um, any other comments in relation to that, uh, Chief Inspector Kennedy? Thank you. Obviously, uh, I've got the uh, lead in, that, uh, in relation to licensing. However, I've spoken to the licensing departments within each territorial division, which obviously covers the whole of Scotland. And the general feedback, there's some that work very well. Aberdeen, obviously, is one of the ones that has been uh, in Glasgow particularly are, are very favourable but some of the comments I would echo that the feedback I'm getting from licensing uh, staff is that the numbers in some forums are very small so small that sometimes when they meet they can't actually deliver anything because it's police, NHS and maybe some uh, an elected member is present also a lack of young people and a uh, young persons representative which obviously if you look at license objectives is about protecting young people and uh, the other one is probably a lack of consistency in relation to what the expectation is as to what is to be delivered. And the final one, which is, was a common theme from the feedback that I got, was in relation to who actually chairs them. Um, I think you know the, the difference is that it was looked to the police to chair it and whether that's the right uh, argument or agreement as to whether it should be. But again, the feedback, again, uh, emphasising is that if there's no local authority input and support, that they seem to not achieve the same across the board. So that's a kind of general... Yeah. Uh, it does sound a little bit like statutory agencies talking to statutory agencies rather than this big kind of public feed-in. Uh, Mary Miller, could you come yeah. point? Just very briefly, it was just to give um, what has been a fairly positive experience in Glasgow with the, the local licensing forum. Our meetings are very well attended and it's a really good cross-section of different uh, aspects of the licensed trade that are represented, also community representatives, as well as those sort of statutory agencies, health, police, uh, and representatives from the, the licensing board and licensed standards officers as well. And what is a practical issue we found is very helpful to the work of the forum is to develop at the start of each year a work plan where we set out what the, the areas that we want to look at in the year ahead and to have regular reports from the likes of police, health, licensed standards officers. It gives a bit of focus to the discussions. And then we also, that opportunity to keep members up to date with things like the most recent discussion on uh, compliance and enforcement around the new minimum pricing mm. uh, requirements. So having that work plan in place uh, does help maintain the, the focus of the discussions and keeps the interest in it going. Okay, thank you. Laura, I will take you back in a second, I, I promise, but I'm just wondering from the industry side, uh, John, John Lee, if you get anything you want to add. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, SGF um, has membership of two licensing forums. Um, my colleague attends one, and, and generally I, I attend the other. Um, we think it's important that uh, retail, particularly small retail, has some kind of representation on licensing forums. Um, about 80% of our members will have alcohol licences, so it's an important issue for them. Um, alcohol as a category contributes to about 14% of the, the, the total turnover of an independent convenience store. Um, so so these, these are important issues for, for our members. So we think, think it's important that retail um, is represented on the um, licensing forums. The licensing forum I attend, uh, I, I would say, uh, is well represented in terms of community councils, um, the NHS, uh, and the licensed license trade generally. So from that point of view, I think it is um, quite representative. Um, if there's one criticism I would make of the licensing forum that I attend um, is that it's become obsessed with a single issue, uh, which is over-provision, um, to the exclusion of all others. Um, 
there's not really any other subjects of, of, of conversation, which I think is a pity because I think as boards and as forums have to take a wider cognizance of alcohol-related harm, health, I, I think there are kind of other issues that they, they, they could be looking at. There are very interesting things happening within the board area of the, the forum that I sit on uh, in terms of trying to, community-based projects that are trying to reduce alcohol-related harm, but the, the forum takes no interest in them whatsoever um, because the, the only topic of discussion is, is, is over-provision. Um, and I, I think that is becoming in, uh, inhibiting uh, the forum from, from developing a wider, a wider, more useful role. Okay, can I actually hold on to that thought in a moment? I'll go to uh, MSPs in to explore that further. But I did mention industry, so over provision to one side. And please, we will, I promise you we'll come back to it because it's an issue. We're going to ask a question on it in a second. And Mr. Shearer, do you want to add anything? Yes, uh, I'd probably argue against John and over provision. Uh, I won't, uh, we'll discuss it later. Now. The, uh, yeah, the SLT, we are on most of the forums and so on. I suppose the, the only sort of comment we've made, it's a fantastic thing because it brings together the police, the, all the various community bodies, alcohol uh, focus, the whole, the whole thing together. But I, one of the areas I think we, and if you look around the country, and I've actually been in a few right around the country, is we'd like to see something more nationalised, you know, more together, more sort of coordinated because uh, there's various things being discussed. And, and I always think of these things, you know, it's people will fall off these things if it's just discussion, 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 discussion. There's nothing going on. There's no decisions being made. It's not influencing areas where there are concerns, etc. So, So there needs to be a coordination, I think, nationally of it. Okay. Um, and take Laura Mahan and then Graham Simpson, MSP, takes on to the, the, the next topic of conversation. Laura. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the, the Scottish Government commissioned um, an evaluation to accompany the alcohol strategy, and part of that evaluation was an evaluation of the implementation of the Licensing Act, uh, the MISAS evaluation that people might be familiar with. And that, that evaluation was concerned about licensing forums, and they had interviewed numerous stakeholders within licensing about how the, the Licensing Act was being operationalised, and licensing forums consistently came out as a a point of concern. Alcohol Focus Scotland then held a series of regional events at the end of 2016 with a wide range of different licensing stakeholders and the functioning of forums was one of the key topics of discussion at those uh, meetings where we sought to try and formulate recommendations about what would improve the situation. And there was a number of recommendations, including the establishment of some kind of national forum or national umbrella body. Uh, we also had the calls for mandatory training for licensing forum members in line with other licensing stakeholders, the opportunity to share and network and learn from the good practice of some of the forums that you're, you're hearing about here today. When it came to the National Forum issue, one of the th problems that we identified with that recommendation is that there seems to be um, different interpretations of what a National Forum would be for and what it would do. So some people talk about it being a national body where representatives of all of the forums could come together to share good practice. Other people talk about it being a kind of umbrella body that delivers um, guidance and uh, support downwards into the licensing forum system. So the recommendation that we ended up publishing on the back of those events was that, that there needed to be a review of licensing forums because it's so difficult to, to get a, a handle on how they're functioning and why some of them are doing well and others aren't. Um, and it's, it, it needs a bit of resource behind it because it would, it would involve somebody having to go and meet with them, I think, because it is so difficult to contact them and get the information provided that way. Thank you. Now, before we move to Graham Simpson, actually an apology, because I've heard from the various stakeholders around the table, but the only person I've not given opportunity to speak to yet is Roger Colcott, who's representing the community for, in which he stays. Roger, do you want to add anything before we move to the next line of questioning? Um, uh, no, not really at this stage. I mean, I'm not a member of a licensing forum. Mm. I, I do attend the Edinburgh licensing forum fairly regularly as a member of the public. Um, uh, it, it, it's a difficult situation there because at the moment I, I don't know whether you know that uh, there's a current review of the licensing forum in, in Edinburgh being conducted by the 
uh, Governance, Risk and Best Value uh, Committee of Edinburgh City Council. Um, I think the report is probably due in a month or two, but pending that, things are a bit up in the air. Okay. And, we'll, and I, have, I should say to all, all witnesses yourself as well, Roger, if you don't catch my eye clearly, I'll just, I'll, I, I don't do subtlety, right? So make sure that, that you catch my eye if you want. And moving on to our line of question, Graham Simpson, MSP. Thanks. Um, before, before I talk in any detail about over-provision, John, you, you, you mentioned uh, a particular forum that, that you sit on that seems to be obsessed by it. Um, I just wonder what the makeup of that forum is. Um, as I say, it seems to be quite well, uh, well represented by community council representatives, um, the police, um, NHS, and uh, the license, the on trades. Uh, this, this, we're the only um, retail, uh, small retail uh, representative on it. Um, so I, I guess all the all the main stakeholders are are there, uh, the police, NHS, the community councils. Uh, so the, I think the representation is is, is fairly good. However, um, as I say, the main, the only topic of conversation really, and it has been for the past two or three years that I've been involved in the forum, has been, has been over provision. And there's a constant going around the circles. The mantra is there are too many licenses, something has to be done about this. And it just constantly goes round in that, that loop. Yeah. It really is like Groundhog Day going to one of these meetings. And, and I think increasingly that's becoming a pity because there are other things happening that I think that the, the forum could could look at. Um, but this is acting as a sort of inhibitor, I think, and, and giving the, the, the forum a very narrow focus and stopping it having any kind of wider wider influence. The board, the licensing board that the forum connects to, um, is interested in the, the area of over-provision and indeed has, is legally obliged to, to take an interest in. But the board, I think, takes a very pragmatic view towards over-provision, um, and it constantly keeps it under review. But the only thing it ever hears from the licensing forum is, you've got to do something about over-provision. There's too many licenses. Something's got to be done. The, the areas of over-provision have to be increased. And that just becomes this kind of circular, self-referencing process, yeah. which, uh, as an attendee, uh, I find, I find um, frustrating. But to go back to one of my earlier points, why do we attend? Because we, we, we feel it's important that smaller retails have some kind of representation on these mm. potentially very important bodies. Okay. Um, so when, when, when I sat on the licensing board, and it, it was East Kilbride so in, in South Lanarkshire, and we, we a bit like Aberdeenshire, split South Lanarkshire up into, into four areas. Um, and of course, one of our, one of our jobs was to split East Kilbride up uh, as we saw fit um, and decide where there was or wasn't over provision and I, I found that one of the difficulties was actually getting any evidence for that from from stakeholders health service police whatever because you have to provide some evidence and very often there wasn't any so you ended up as a board member just ta just taking a view um, and our view was there was no over provision in in East Kilbride, uh, but somebody else could take it could easily take a contrary view. So it was a difficulty, and I just wonder what the the experience sort of around the country is. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of interest in, in, in that question, so we'll, we'll take a few people. Roger Colcott. Uh, yes, this this question of uh, over provision is, uh, you know. A mixed question. I mean, what is enough provision? There isn't any sort of standard. There's no uh, indication that there should be at least this many or not more than this. Um, in, in, in Edinburgh, uh, there was an attempt to look at the, the harms arising in different areas, but that was based on, I think they're called intermediate areas. Um, I'm not sure that right, that if that's the right term, but they're sort of uh, census areas, and they're very small numbers of people. Well, I, I don't know, just a few thousand, something like that. And the trouble is, in a in a um, uh, highly populated area like the centre of Edinburgh, that means you're looking at very small districts and trying to decide: is this somewhere there's a lot of harm? Is this somewhere that's less harm? Comparing it with the overall 
statistics for Edinburgh. Um, and the other issue is, where do people buy their alcohol? I mean, it's increasingly the case that most alcohol is sold through off-licenses rather than um, on-licensed premises. They don't necessarily buy uh, within their local district. So the fact that the harm may arise in one place doesn't mean that's where the alcohol is bought. So it's very difficult to say. Certainly where I live, there are enormous numbers of, of uh, pubs and bars and, and clubs and so on. But then it's a central area, so a lot of people come in from outside to, to uh, uh, do their drinking, if you like. Um, so where you place the over-provision areas is a very difficult thing for people to decide. Okay, Stuart Wilson. The, the issue of over-provision has been one of the topics, not the only topic in, in the forum, uh, but we are concerned about the patterns of purchasing that are changing much, much more online purchasing. How do you measure over-provision in East Ayrshire when people are purchasing from somebody who should remain nameless a long distance away? Um, should that be included in your provision? It's no longer, in our opinion, the small corner off-licence. It's the much bigger organisation. It's the global organisations nowadays, and I, I think we need to take on board th that pattern is changing. But, but we're aware that over-provision is very subjective. What data should we be using uh, to measure? Uh, you know, you pull a figure out here. There, yeah. And I suspect that was going to be some of the follow-ups. Uh, John Shearer? Yes, it's uh, interesting. We've been talking about this since 1880, and... Uh, various times throughout the ages, uh, I haven't been here since 1880, but <laughs> the uh, <coughs> various times throughout the ages there's been decisions made and so on. I, I'm not sure if the MSPs are all aware, it's really ve very difficult to uh, uh, to refuse a licence uh, on over provision because the Act is very weak. It's very difficult to, to take it through. But if you look at alcohol sales, I mean, really, it's not so much that the small uh, the, the Grocers Association and so on. It's the big supermarkets, obviously, and uh, your 70%. I remember, again, through time, the, the days when it was 70% of alcohol was sold through pubs, etc. Uh, similar outlets, 30% uh, off sales and supermarkets. Now it's the other way around. So we, we would, uh, you can see the way it's going, and that's actually getting more and more and more. So that's going 80 20, even. It's going that much. So we would always argue, we try and represent the whole of the trade. We don't try and just represent pubs and hotels and so on. <clears throat> and these days, and we're very keen, obviously, on uh, having food and alcohol outlets where it's a mix of things going on. It's not just alcohol, but, but we try and represent the whole trade. Personal license holders is a new big thing. But the, the Act, I think the Act, uh, opposite John, I think the Act has to be strengthened. And I think uh, if you look at Ireland as a great example, there's been no new licenses in Ireland since 1902. And the, the other thing a license does, when you, if you have a limited number of licenses of people selling alcohol, you, the, the value of the license goes up. And it becomes a, uh, an item of borrowing against, uh, uh, increasing your business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's, it's a big thing in Ireland. Uh, so I think, we, I think we've gone way the other way and I think we have to come back again. Uh, I mean, I'd love to see support the pubs and hotels etc and give us more advantage in getting, if you get people into a pub, hotel, into a controlled environment with alcohol you have a much better system. There's no question about that. But we're not saying there shouldn't be obviously other ways of selling alcohol. But I think it has gone too far the other way. And supermarkets, again I don't know if everyone's aware, but supermarkets went for licensing they basically uh, licensed the whole premises. And that was another thing that we probably missed in Scotland was uh, uh, in other countries, when you go into a supermarket, they have an area for alcohol, you know, so you, you have a different section and so on. So we would, we would argue actually for more, uh, for over-provision to be a major item. And, uh, uh, I'm just going to come in there because when a, when a supermarket or any shop comes in for a license, they, they have to put a plan in True. and show where the where the alcohol is going to be. That so was, that, that, that's right, that's, that's and exactly the board, right. the board would approve, or did, <coughs> I think in the approve something that would be on that basis. I think in the early days, Graeme, it, was, it wasn't seen as an issue. You know, where do you sell the alcohol? 
and the whole premises. It was just easier, I think. I think it was just that it was easier to do, just to uh, license the whole premises. Uh, nowadays, we're probably looking at that a bit more and saying, well, hold on a second. You, know, you shouldn't be selling the alcohol on the way out with the, the sweets and the chocolates and so on. Uh, but the, the fact of life is that 70% of alcohol is uh, sold via supermarkets. Uh, minimum unit pricing we've been arguing with, uh, we've been arguing about for years as well. And it's great to see that coming in and that will have an effect. It will have an effect. Okay, now, um, just for so MSPs know, Graham, if you want to follow up on some of this, I'll let you in shortly. And Monica, I know you, you want to come in at some point in relation to this, but I'm, I'm going to take our witnesses first. A few people have indicated they wish to speak further on this. Susan Elliott. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that when we're considering over provision, it, we need to be clear that it's not about reducing the number of licensed premises in the area, but it's about considering the alcohol availability and alcohol related harm. And over provision allows the opportunity to put a cap or stop more licensed premises and more availability of alcohol coming in. In relation to your question about what data, there has been recent data published to local areas by AFS and CRESH, and, and I'll have to refer to my notes to get the abbreviation. So, Centre for Research and Environment, Society and Health, so the Universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow. So, those local area profiles have been developed for areas to look at the availability of alcohol in the area. And what it does is it takes it from the centre population, and if you walk 10 minutes, basically, how much access do you have to alcohol, both on sales and off sales, so it, and it breaks that data down so we can look at the different areas. So, for example, in Scottish Borders, we are below the average in terms of alcohol outlet as a whole, but when you drill down deeper into the data, 25% of our neighbourhoods are much higher, and one particular area is four times higher in terms of on-sale availability of alcohol than the Scottish average. So, so that data is available, but what we do need is guidance and people who can understand it and drill down. And there are expertise out there within Alcohol Focus Scotland and in local areas that we can pull upon to make sure that licensing boards can have that information and then they can make evidence decisions around over provision. Okay, Mary Miller. Yeah, it was really just to pick up on that point about evidence-based decisions, I think, which was part of Mr Simpson's opening comments on, on the topic. There's often concern expressed around the, the current statutory guidance requiring a causal link uh, for the development of over-provision policies between the uh, numbers of licensed premises and the harm that is seen to be caused. And there's a, some suggestion that that reference to causal links should be removed. However, removing the reference and the guidance is still going to require licensing boards to have an evidence-based approach to its decision-making and its policies. That's implicit in the way in which licensing case law has developed over the years. Um, I think you, you do have to have evidence, and certainly the way that we've approached this in Glasgow is we do get very good evidence based on those intermediate data zones from our colleagues in uh, public health and from the police. And in terms of establishing a causal link, I, I, my personal view is it's not terribly difficult. For example, if you have a convenience store by, which by its very nature is intending to sell alcohol to the local area and there's evidence that there's alcohol-related harm existing already in that area, then it's fairly easy to, to draw that causal link between adding further provision. But of course, over-provision is not the only way in which um, it's not the only ground for refusal. We've had examples where we've got particularly bad public health figures, but there's no existing licences in the area. And we've been able to successfully uh, refuse a new licence, not on over-provision, but on public health. That pr making alcohol actually available in an area that already exists, it has alcohol-related harm, that that is sufficient to justify that other ground for refusal around uh, not being consistent with that licensing objective. OK, Laura Mann, do you want to come? Yeah, I would just pick up on, on Mary's point there. I think the, the causal link issue has been an area of much discussion and contention within the licensing system for a good 10 years. And it's, it's not so much about the need to remove the idea of causal link from the legislation or from the guidance, but about clarifying what we're actually talking about with regard to a causal link. And I think in the, the guidance that's being updated at the moment, there's been an attempt to clarify that you can look at the collective impact of alcohol licences in an area and the harm and, the, and look at a causal link about the collective 
influence that, that those licenses have on rates of alcohol harm. Um, so rather than it being about trying to prove that an individual premises is causing X harm, it's about accepting that this collection of licensed premises and the availability of alcohol overall could potentially be creating problems. The research that, that Susan refers to at a Scotland-wide level, that research shows that areas with the highest rates of alcohol outlet availability compared to the lowest rates of alcohol outlet availability have double the alcohol-related death rate, almost double the alcohol-related hospitalisation rate, and four times the crime rate. So the evidence base around the link between availability and harm has been something that academics have been trying to enhance and develop with a view to making it easier for licensing boards. You know, there's been calls for some time to try and get this evidence down to a local level that people can use within the licensing boards. And I think we're, we're kind of constantly trying to add to that evidence base. But in, in my view, the, the evidence is there. There's, there's over 50 studies that show that association between availability and harm. And as Mary says, there are licensing boards that are being very proactive and, and uh, trying to put that cap in place. It's not about reducing provision. It's simply about preventing any increases where there's concern about the impact it's having on communities. So just to clarify, it's about new entrants to the market as much as it's about withdrawing licences from existing? So an over-provision, so a board is required to undertake an over-provision assessment. If the board finds that it's, it's concerned about over-provision in a particular area, it can it can make a statement that that area is, is over-provided for. That over-provision statement creates what they call a rebuttable presumption against the granting of further licences. So it actually, in, in my view, and, and the clerks can maybe talk to this, it, it, it actually provides what I would say is an, an easier route for objecting to alcohol licences because there is a presumption to grant licences inherent within the system and the over-provision statement creates this rebuttable presumption against granting it. Licensing boards still have to take every application on their own merit, so it doesn't, it doesn't result in an outright ban. They still have to consider every application and there is an opportunity for the applicants to um, present evidence that would demonstrate that they are not going to contribute to further harm. So a licensing board can still grant new licences, but it's a, it's a tool to enable them to put a kind of cap in place if they have concerns about the impact in that area. Okay, Roger Colcott. Uh, yes, I'd like to pick up on some of the things that Laura's just said. Um, uh, first of all, I think probably the biggest issue really now uh, regarding alcohol consumption is the public health issue. I mean, it's really, really serious. I think the, the last statistics of the whole of Scotland that I've seen show that the amount of alcohol sold in Scotland was enough for every adult to consume 20 units a week, every week. Um, now, that can't be good for the health of Scotland. Um, but coming back to this point about the, the overall harm to an area, um, and then the point about each case being judged on its own merits. In my experience um, of quite often attending uh, the Edinburgh Licensing Board, admittedly this is mainly of the previous board, the new board might be slightly different, um, they always focus on this question of uh, judging the individual case on its own merits. And when it comes to public health, it seems to me that's almost like saying to a person trying to give up smoking to judge each cigarette on its own merits. You know, on that basis, you'd never give up. So there has to be something that says that there's some sort of provision that ensures that there isn't an overall increase in the provision within the area. And what I would suggest, and my local community council wants to see, is that the whole of Edinburgh should be regarded as an area of overprovision of the sort of premises where alcohol is sold alongside food and other normal household purchases for two reasons. First of all, there's this continuing normalisation of alcohol. Now, alcohol isn't normal, otherwise we wouldn't have a licensing act. 
And for generations now, small children have been going into supermarkets with their parents and seeing alcohol sold just like bread, potatoes, milk, whatever. And the other thing is that these premises encourage impulse buying. I don't know whether they set out to do so, but that's the impact. You know, you go in for your, what are you going to have for tea tonight? Or oh, must nip into the local Tesco Express or whatever. And there you see, ah, there's that nice red wine we had a little while ago, and it's a pound off. Oh, well, we'll get a couple of those now. You may think you're going to put them aside when you get home, but you get home and your partner says, oh, you're a lifesaver. You wouldn't believe the day I've had. Opens a bottle and there it goes. And there's another few units that are being consumed that wouldn't otherwise have been consumed. So I think something along those lines is definitely needed. I think there's a lot of uh, knowing nods when you, you said that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Colquitt. Thanks for saying that. Now, I, I want to give MSPs a chance to come in. I did say that Mr. Simpson could follow up on some of this, but I wonder if what we could do, if you could make any observations or questions of Mr. Simpson and then to Monica Lee then straight after that, and we'll go back to our witnesses so they can they can chew over that. And Alexander Stewart, I've, I've, I've seen that you want in at some point. Um, yes, everyone wants in at some point, but I have to give priority to the witnesses where I can. Mr. Simpson, do you want to add anything? Um, I'll be really brief because other people want in. Um, I, I just wanted to say I've actually seen the um, alcohol focus and crash studies for the areas I represent, North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire. Really interesting stuff. Um, it would be good, and maybe it does, but I haven't seen it. Maybe if it drilled down, uh, you know, to, to a bit more more local uh, within those areas, mm -hmm. I think that'll be. You can do that. You can do that. We'll probably need to provide lessons to people on how to do that, but it, it, yeah. that, that's part of our plan over the next few months okay. is to go out and but, uh, help people no, understand in, uh, Very you know, in, in, interesting. I mean, in, in North Lanarkshire, crime rates in the neighbourhoods with the most alcohol outlets were 2.7 times higher than in neighbourhoods with the least. And in uh, South Lanarkshire, alcohol-related death rates in the neighbourhoods with the most off-sales outlets we're 80% higher than in neighbourhoods with the least. So, really interesting uh, statistics there. I, I, I think that there has been some advantage to being on this committee, Mr Simpson. I suspect that MSPs around this table, uh, their constituencies and communities would quite like a uh, discussion at some point with Alcohol Focus Scotland to better understand those statistics for our own community. Certainly, if we're going to do some further work on this, it would certainly bring home to us what that means in our local area. So, I'm not trying to bounce it into that, Laura, but I think we'd appreciate a, a more granular look at those Absolutely. those statistics. Absolutely. Uh, if that if that offers there, yes, we've managed to secure that. <laughs> uh, Monica Lennon. Thanks, convener. Um, the discussion's moved on quite a bit from when I indicated I had a question, but if I can. Go back to well, it was it was John Lee who prompted my uh, signal. Um, your comments, um, John, about the forum that you attend, being obsessed about uh, over provision, and I remember that Susan um, Susan Elliot earlier on said in your evidence that your forum's working on um, the alcohol profile for your area, and that's a big piece of work. I wondered if that's something that, that John, I don't know which board, or, sorry, which forum you are talking about, but is that something that, that your forum has that provides some context? Because um, Graeme Simpson's mentioned the stats for, for Lanarkshire. I've got South Lanarkshire in front of me. That's that's where I'm based, and that's where I was a, a councillor before coming here. And when I look at the stats and the levels of alcohol harm in communities, I can well understand why people are obsessed, talking about over-provision and the frustrations. Um, but John, you also said that there's other things the Forum could talk about around public health. Um, and I just wondered, is, is public health not at the heart of these discussions about over-provision? Just wondered wh where you think the tensions are. And we've heard about some of the data available. I just wondered how much data and evidence base your Forum has. Uh, I'm... I'm not totally sure. I mean, it will have access to the Alcohol Focus um, Scotland data and crash data that, that we've heard about. And I think there is some uh, attempt um, at local neighbourhood level to, um, particularly based on community surveys and things, to bring to bring more evidence to the forum, which I'm sure will be helpful. Although the, the strong impression I have is the underlying purpose of that is to strengthen the board's over-provision over policy and generate more discussion um, about, about, about over-provision. And what I meant about the kind of wider, the wider context is in the um, the board area, uh, whose forum I sit on, for example, 
we helped to set up the first um, community alcohol partnership in Scotland, uh, and that has now been replicated across the city. We were involved in a what I feel is a very, very innovative and very successful um, project to clamp down a proxy purchase, which was piloted um, in, in the board area. And it's, we're now looking at a kind of national rollout of that. So these are all kind of community-based initiatives which are aimed at reducing alcohol-related harm, uh, which I think have been successful, involve a, a wider range of stakeholders. The forum shows absolutely no interest in looking at these these other projects, which I think it should take cognizance of and should be more and more um, uh, interested in as a way of reducing alcohol-related harm and engaging communities in the whole process. But the overall, the, 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 the obsession with overprovision acts as an inhibitor to that, I feel, and that's not, that's not looked at. Those kind of wider initiatives, um, which I think are successful, community-based, um, are just not on the, uh, the agenda for, look, for, that, for that's discussion. That's helpful preparing for today it kind of struck me that there isn't really a clear definition of over provision so I just wondered what does over provision mean to you and is there a situation where you could say yeah this area clearly has over provision my, my understanding is that there's no template formula benchmark really for for over provision I think the the board just has to make some sort of assessment of is there harm and then is that related to uh, crime, alcohol-related disorder and premises. There doesn't seem to be uh, an accepted formula or benchmark benchmark for it. So it's difficult to know what the decisions are, are, are based on. And I suppose that ambiguity means that everyone is kind of searching for a new and more effective way um, to, to make assessments of overprovision and make assessments of where the, the boundaries should be which again is feeding into this kind of constant iterative discussion um, about it. So there doesn't seem to be like a, at board level, uh, an accepted kind of benchmark or formula for, for looking at over provision that I'm aware of. Laura Mann, do you want to explain? Yeah, I just, I think it's important to be clear about what the role of a local licensing forum is. While, while a local licensing forum can and potentially should take a, a broad interest in alcohol harm and efforts to reduce alcohol harm across its area, that should always be with a view to providing the licensing board with intelligence and information. That, that's one of the functions of a licensing forum. But at the end of the day, the, the purpose of the licensing forum is to keep the operation of the Licensing Act under review in their area. So there are examples from other areas where actually a licensing forum has ended up diverting all of its attention to promoting and supporting community-based initiatives to reduce alcohol harm. And actually, that isn't what the function of a licensing forum is. Um, and, and I think that, that just speaks to some of the confusion about why are they there, what are they intended to do, and the need for the provision of clear guidance and support to that effect so that they remain focused on, on their, their role within the Act. John Lee, do you want to come back on that? Just very quickly, just I don't disagree with what Laura said, but um, I think inc increasingly the problem is that licensing boards are being asked to, um, in a way, take on too wide a remit. And to go back to something I think Mary said, a board is really just look, there to look at an application and, and make a decision on it, on it on its merits. If the grounds are met, then the application is, is successful, and if they're not, then it's rejected. But increasingly, boards are being asked to look at these big issues about crime disorder, alcohol-related harm, public health, which makes the, 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 the role very, very difficult. Um, but if they're going to be asked to do that, then I think they and forums have to start taking a wider look at a lot of these kind, type of community initiatives that are, that are feeding into these policy agendas. Okay, I'm going to get Laura to come back in and then Susan Elliott after that. Obviously, part of the day-to-day -day business of a licensing board is the scrutiny of applications and decisions on individual applications, but the entire Licensing Act is underpinned by the five licensing objectives, which are the promotion and protection of public health, uh, preventing crime and disorder, protecting children and young people from harm. Um, boards are required to produce a statement of licensing policy that for now will be... Will be in place for five years and that statement of licensing policy is to set out how the board intends to seek to promote those licensing objectives so that they do have that bigger responsibility it's not just about processing applications it's processing applications in the context of those five licensing objectives i will let you back in john before we go back to msps but other witnesses want in susan elliott 
It was, it was just to highlight the role of other partnerships in local authorities. So you have the alcohol and drug partnerships who um, oversee the national drug and alcohol strategies and are responsible for reducing that harm in their areas. So there are other partnerships out there that have that role. And we have <coughs> our licensing board chair sitting on our ADP, which again is a good link to make sure that they have a wider understanding of the implications. It's not necessarily the role of the forum to look at that or the licensing board, but they have an understanding. So whilst we may have presentations on wider pieces of work, and I'll certainly um, increase their awareness, th there are other partnerships we can be linking into for that. And one of the things we've started to do locally is um, bring in other stakeholders. So the Children and Young People's Leadership Group have a role um, considering license applications where um, children are involved in family events. So considering that children and young people's licensing objective. So thinking about other planning committees, other structures that can be linking in and influencing licensing as well. Stuart Wilson. Yeah, <coughs> and, you know, Laura was talking about the work done by Alcohol Focus, and I think Alcohol Focus are doing sterling work, but I think they're letting Scottish Government off the hook a wee bit. They're doing some of the work that should perhaps be done centrally by Scottish Government. The Act created the forum, um, and the input from Scottish Government since 2005 has not been massive, shall we say, and I think there's, there's a... a a desire for some kind of steer, guidance, support. Handling statistics uh, is quite a technical requirement and many of the forums don't have the training or the expertise alcohol focus doing are very helpful. But I think there is a need for the government to take over some of the work that they are, they are doing. You've made that point pretty clearly and one of the things our committee does after this evidence session, as we review the evidence and discuss what steps we take next, you don't think just because you've said it, we're not directly following up on it just now, means we, ha we haven't heard you, we, we have heard you. Mr Lee, I did say I'd give you the opportunity to come back in before back to MSPs. Do you want, do you want to add anything? Oh, thanks, Camino. Just very, very briefly, it was just to say that Laura mentioned the, the licensing objectives. In a way, they do broaden out the, the, the scope and the, the terms of reference and the remit of the board to take license of all those different factors. So, um, the objectives in themselves, I think, mean that the board makes the, the board's task more difficult in that it's got to take a much wider view of all of, all of, those, all of those issues. OK, we're going to go back to MSPs. And I know there's a frustration for MSPs, but it's not a normal evidence session, so the conversation quite often moves on as other witnesses want to come in and, and have their say. So my apologies to MSPs for that, but that is the dynamic. Monica, I want to let you get a chance to come back in because it was your question, but Alexander, I'm going to go to you straight after this to allow you, your question may have changed, but gives you the opportunity to come in at this point. I wasn't Monica. looking to come back in. Okay. No, I'm happy that you can move on. Well, that's great. Alexander. I mean, Convener, I think this is very useful because what we have seen already today uh, is that the quality that's happening within licensing boards, which we've been aware of, but also the quality that's now happening within the forums uh, and the, the partnership working that has taken place. But I still get a sense there's a bit of tension there between the two as to how they can achieve both of their objectives. Uh, the licensing board ha are, are working to the law and working through that process, and the forum has a role to play, but at the same time, the forum doesn't have the power. Uh, and that seems to be one of the problems we're facing here today. Now, I know there's been quite a lot of consultation happened in Glasgow, uh, and, and you've gone out there and done a lot of consultation with lots of organisations and individuals, and you touched on over provision. Uh, but in my experience with over provision in the past, sometimes there was an anxiety, there was a fear of tackling over provision because of the legal challenge that could happen, and boards fell into that trap in some way. Uh, so I'd like to try and tease that out, because I do think that has an influence on where we actually are. Or the decisions that licensing boards take. Um, one of the points I was trying to make in my paper was there's often a frustration amongst mm -hmm. communities when they think their, their views aren't taken mm -hmm. into account. Um, but licensing boards do have to legally be able to mm -hmm. justify the decisions that they take, and that's why the over-provision assessment is so important and that the evidence that, that sits behind that, enabling licensing boards to take decisions which have a fair chance of, of being mm -hmm. um, upheld within, within the courts. Because every time that a licensing board takes a decision and there's not a good evidential mm -hmm. basis for it and that decision is overturned, it almost sort of tightens the noose around all licensing boards because it, every time the courts make a 
a, a decision. It almost places more restrictions on the ways in which the licensing boards can exercise decisions in future. So I really can't emphasise enough about having a, a, a process for collecting information, views, evidence as part of the development of licensing policy statements that will help decisions taken by the, the board and make them as robust as possible to, to be able to withhold, withstand legal challenge. Certainly in Glasgow, we're not afraid to take uh, difficult decisions and you know we have been challenged in the past and we've been successful in defending decisions taken on the grounds of overprovision and particularly one against a, a national retailer that, that challenged a decision to refuse one of their applications on the grounds of overprovision. And the, without doubt, there are barriers to the whole process going forward. Uh, and I think that you've identified what is required and to have the courage to manage that process is very important. But I think that the comment that was made earlier about the government now trying to take a role to try and come in to support the mechanism, I think that's quite an important convener because it's quite obvious that people feel that they need that backup and they need that support uh, and that mechanism isn't necessarily being uh, adhered to as we state at the moment. Okay, now, uh, no other witnesses were asking to come in on that specific point. Now, can I, can I check with MSPs? A few indications to speak. Mr Whiteman is the next on my list, but in specifically in relation to courts and enforcement and decisions been overturned. Any other MSPs have indicated to speak? Was that the area that we're going to cover? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, Mr Simpson. On, on that issue, um, I just wonder if anyone round the table has any evidence of um, where boards have have refused applications, let's say on over provision grounds, it's then gone to court and, uh, and, and been overturned. Um, Laura right. seems to have the answer. Yeah, th I mean, there's been a couple of fairly high profile uh, appeal cases just in the last couple of years. One um, involving Dundee Licensing Board and another involving Aberdeen Licensing Board where uh, licence applications were refused on the grounds of over-provision and an appeal went to court and the sheriff found in favour of the applicant. Um, in both of those cases, where the licensing board um, kind of fell down was on the process that they had followed with regards to establishing their over-provision position. And it just echoes what Mary's saying about needing to follow a really robust and clear evidence gathering process and show reasoned arguments from that evidence to the position that you're taking. I think one of the bits that the Scottish Government have, have been called upon by ourselves and I think most other parts of the licensing system for a number of years now that would help with this situation is to update the guidance, the statutory guidance that accompanies the Licensing Act with a particular view to clarifying the process for establishing an over-provision position. Now, the Scottish Government have recently undertaken an exercise to begin to update that guidance. AFS has got some concerns about the process that that has been following to date um, in that the two chapters that were focused on initially were the over-provision chapter and the statements of licensing policy chapter, and that was with a view to clarifying those processes in particular. What they called an expert advisory group was established to inform that update. We were part of that advisory group, but I don't think that all of the licensing stakeholders that should have been represented on that group were there. It was also a very short time scale within which to review what is very detailed and complex guidance. It was established at the start that that advisory group was probably not going to reach consensus on some of the most uh, contentious issues, and we agreed to that, and we didn't reach consensus uh, on certain points. And what was agreed with that was that where we didn't reach consensus, the notes would be taken in full and would be returned to the Scottish Government so that they could take a decision on what would make it into that guidance. The problem from my perspective with that is that that's what happened, but then the final draft of that guidance was never returned to the advisory group for sight before it was issued to licensing boards. So what's been issued to licensing boards is two draft chapters of the guidance. I'm not clear on what status those chapters have at this point in time, um, and I think it has the potential to add to the confusion and this is at a critical point where li licensing boards are currently developing their statements of licensing policy for publication in November. I'm still not clear on which 
guidance they're to follow, because right now, the existing statutory guidance is the legal instrument. And these two draft chapters, as far as I can see, have no legal standing. So that's a problem. I'm sure that's something our committee will want to get clarity on as soon as possible as well. Fiona Stewart, did you want to add? So wearing my other hat as uh, chair of the Solar Licensing Forum, which represents clerks all across Scotland, I was also involved in the advisory group. I share Laura's concerns. Uh, as far as uh, we are concerned in, in Solar, and as far as I'm concerned as the deputy clerk of the North Licensing Board, it's been rushed. It's not been done properly. They are draft. They've not been approved by the Scottish Parliament. Therefore, they don't have the weight of law behind them. Therefore, licensing boards at the moment are still bound to follow the 2007 guidance, which means we're missing out on this policy review. Um, and it will be for the licensing boards after the next local government election where that guidance will take effect and by which time we're five years down the line and that guidance is already going to be out of date. So I, I echo uh, Laura's concerns there. It's, it's, we've been calling for this since 2007. That guidance was written before the 2005 Act even went live in 2009. It was well-intentioned, but we've moved on a long way since then. It's no longer fit for purpose and I still don't think it's fit for purpose purpose. That's now, that's now all on the, the official record. That's Again, fine. Because we're not following up on it just now, <laughs> doesn't mean we're not going to follow up on it. Uh, Mr Colquitt, do you still wish to come in? Yes, I just want to go back to the question of evidence, because I'm, I'm not sure if I'm correct in this, but from what I gather, the, the big uh, retail chains refuse to disclose the quantity of alcohol they sell on grounds of commercial confidentiality. And I don't know what can be done about that, but it seems unless something can be done to override that, we'll always have difficulty in gathering the necessary evidence, particularly as we've seen that they provide 70% or more of the alcohol that's bought in Scotland. OK, thank you. That's on the record now as well. We might not explore that at this point, but, but thanks for your attention. We'll move on to our next line of questioning, uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I should probably declare an interest as a licence holder for the Scottish Parliament. A um, couple of questions. Uh, licensing standards officers were introduced in the 2005 Act. What difference, if any, have they made? Has that been a useful um, intervention? And secondly, um, uh, if folk have any comments about the scale of resources available to local authorities to run licensing boards to to, to deliver their statutory functions and also support local licensing forums and gather the kind of wider evidence that's needed to be able to buttress some of the decisions you need to make. Mm. Uh, Laura Mann. Um, just in response to the LSO question, the, the evaluation that I was referring to earlier that the MISAS uh, team at NHS Health Scotland undertook about the implementation of the Licensing Act, the establishment of licensing standards officers came out of that evaluation as being one of the most positive aspects of the new Act. And I think generally all licensing stakeholders agree that those posts have really enhanced things, particularly in relation to the... Um, relationship between the trade and licensing boards and facilitating communication and enhancing understanding. So and at our regional events that I mentioned, again, LSOs and the function of LSOs was highlighted by the vast majority of participants. And we had over 200 participants at those events as being very positive. Okay, Mary Miller. Thank you, Convener. Um, we do in licensing, and obviously from this morning we talk a lot about over-provision and we talk a lot about public health, but what I increasingly find is that the issues that are raised with me by local residents, by community councils, is about the operation of existing licensed premises, and it tends to be from the on-trade, because in terms of things like public nuisance, which is also you know, a licensing objective, it's potentially on-sales premises that can have the most direct impact on people living within that area in terms of noise nuisance, potential for antisocial behaviour, and that's where licensing standards officers have been absolutely key in almost like mediating on those issues between uh, local residents and the operational licensed premises, meeting with license holders to, to remind them about their responsibilities, particularly in terms of either license conditions or operating in terms of the licensing objectives. And the vast majority of um, complaints about licensed premises are able to be dealt with on an informal basis without having to be referred to the licensing board. And sometimes it is just that approach being made by a licensing standards officer speaking 
talking to the management of the premises, it just gives them that bit of a reminder about having a bit more regard maybe to the, uh, the local residents within the area and how they manage their premises that prevents an escalation of issues. So licensing standards officers are very good at potentially you know, nipping things in the bud before they, they, they develop into a stage where it would have to be more formal action before a licensing board. Okay, thank you. Stuart Rawson. I'd like to echo what the previous speakers have said. The LSOs are a vital part of all this setup. They, they are the people on the ground. They are the link between the community and the board. They are the link between um, the license holders and the board. Um, they can defuse potential situations before they, they develop. They do a, a tremendous amount of good work. Um, they are very supportive of the licensed trade in East Ayrshire. There is a scheme, which I'm sure some of you know, called Pub Watch, and that um, has the great support of the, the LSOs. There is also another scheme, Best Bar None, and um, the LSOs have a big part to, to play in that. So they have been very, very successful uh, in terms of, of the Act. I think it was a very positive contribution to make. Just before I bring other witnesses in, and I apologise for cutting across Mr Whiteman's line of questioning, but we've got about 20 minutes left and there's two other MSPs wanting to come in as well. So I'm going to bring other witnesses in in a second, but at the core of the question was about maybe even how this is financed by local authorities, how they, how local authorities take their approach in relation to that. The amount, apologies for my ignorance, how many LSOs there is in each area? Is, 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 is it set out or does it vary? So any information on that? Because it's part of the new budget scrutiny process that this parliament has. We want a kind of ongoing look at how budgets are used for outcomes on the ground. So anything you could say would be helpful. And I will take you back in at that, on that point, Mr Wilson. Yeah? Yeah. Um, as far as budgets are concerned, there is no budget line that I am aware of to support the forum. Uh, we have a good relationship with the local authority and with the board, but we are at the, the mercy. If we wish to do something, then we have to go and request funding. But there is no separate budget line for forums. Uh, as far as the, the, the funding for the whole operate, the LSOs are, are, are um, members of the local council. There's sometimes a conflict of interest. The, 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 the LSOs, by law, must sit on the forum uh, who are monitoring the board. But the LSOs are also employees of the local authority. And, the board. and up till now, there has been no conflict of interest. But there is a potential conflict of interest in the future. OK, John Shearer, thank you. John Shearer. Yeah, just, uh, on that. I mean, the LSOs, we, uh, we, we agree with what's been said. Barry said there as well as this, this working very well. Now, it did, they did get off on a very shaky start, however, and especially in Glasgow, I think, uh, from what I heard, was, uh, I think the understanding of what an LSO was and what, what his role was and so on caused some confusion, but now it's working very well. But it's interesting to know as well, with licensing fees, et cetera, all going up, 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 as usual, everything goes up, uh, we believe that some areas are actually making a profit uh, uh, from licensing fees. And uh, I think, again, in the Act, I don't think it's meant to be non-profit. OK. So right. that's just something to show. OK, I, I would expect to put it on the record. Yes, uh, Laura Mann. Um, not talking about the fees, but about LSOs, one of the concerns that was raised in the context of talking about the positive impact of the LSOs at the, at the events we held was anecdotal accounts of the resource being reduced as part of austerity measures, I think, where... LSO, LSO, LSO rules in some cases have been expanded to incorporate other aspects of uh, trading standards and things and there have also been reductions in numbers of LSOs in some areas so there's quite a bit of concern being expressed at the end of 2016 about that and then with the introduction of the minimum unit pricing legislation it's LSOs that are going to be responsible for monitoring the compliance with that legislation um, so we are already hearing some anecdotal information from LSOs about the pressure that that's going to uh, put on them and we're anticipating that we are going to uh, see a bit of a resource problem coming. 
Okay, I'm not getting what, what, lots of witnesses wanting to come back in. I, would say, I, I did say I would give preference to witnesses. We're going to name check them all, and then, irrespective of how fascinating your comments are, we're going to move to Jenny Ruth after that, okay, for, for the next line of questioning. So we've got John Lee, we've got Fiona Stewart, and we've got Mary Miller. So I will come to the three of you. John. Convener, it was just to echo um, John's point. He's absolutely right. Um, the level of, of fees that are, that are charged for, for licensees um, are supposed to provide funds for, for LSOs, and that's the, 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 the boards and local authorities are not supposed to make a surplus. But yet, the, the number of LSOs, the sense I have is the number of LSOs are going down all the time. I'd be interested to know how many um, LSOs there are in Glasgow, for example, in relation to um, the amount of licensed premises. So, our, our members have got big concerns that the local authorities now must be in surplus with the, the, the money they're collecting from licence fees, and yet they don't go down, and there's certainly no rebate of them. Okay, thank you very much. Fiona Stewart? Uh, we have four LSOs who work very, very well, not just with the trade, but also with the police, and they're also now working with Security Industry Authority for door supervisors. But I would echo Laura's concerns, because our four LSOs are now also the four civic standards officers for our civic government licensing as well so half of their time now is devoted to non-liquor licensing work plus they have smoking duties it's an awful lot to take on uh, resources are very tight but i would say the the money is not lacking from the premises license fees but it's from the personal license fees and particularly occasional licenses and the amount of work that boards have to do in in conjunction with the fee that we get back or don't get back is the case okay. maybe. the chief inspector you, uh, 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 the, the official report doesn't show you nodding your head so i just i don't know if you want to just no, make a I very brief just, comment I would on that re-emphasize that across again local policing areas is it the lso's and the relationship between police and the lso's has been uh, compounded in relation to the work that's been done. It's a two-tiered approach and we have, rather than the enforcement all the time, we do joint operations, but I would emphasise that the feedback I'm getting from local divisions is that over recent years, the duties of the LSOs has stopped. For instance, we used to do operations on Friday and Saturday nights when it was busier, and obviously that's the best time you're, you're choosing, is that those LSOs are no longer available all the time to do the particular operations in various divisions because of the expansion of their roles, but obviously that's from a policing point of view. Thank you. And Mary Miller? Really just actually to, to make that very point, I think you're all aware there's been a huge amount of new uh, licensing legislation in recent years, much of which has resulted in a, a substantial increase in the work that licensing boards have to do, but also licensing standards officers. Um, the, the introduction of the requirements for p licensing standards officers to um, be consulted on personal license applications is quite significant. The minimum unit pricing is going to have a, a much greater compliance role. We've got immigration changes that are going to require additional work to be carried out by license sections in reviewing applications. We've got the, the um, soon to be the license, uh, personal license holder renewal scheme, which will be a major impact next year. All of these new requirements are being introduced, but without any additional income being generated from all of this extra work. And that does obviously place difficulties on the resources that are available if there's no additional income coming in to support that additional work and scrutiny which licensing boards and licensing standards officers are required to carry out. In Glasgow we, we've remained consistent with four licensing standards officers, however they are supported by colleagues across different enforcement teams in the council, whether it's uh, noise officers, public health officers, environmental health officers, and, and they do work very closely with their colleagues in Police Scotland to, to, to provide... Um, I think it's, I don't have the exact figure here, it's, it's uh, just under 2,000, I think. So you've got four LSOs for 2,000 premises? Yes, but as I say, they're supported by officers uh, and other aspects, depending on what the, the issue of, of concern is. But yes, their the role has expanded in terms of recent changes to legislation. And that, that would be quite helpful, maybe not, not just now, maybe a, a note back to the committee, because if some local authority areas have got a small amount of LSOs and they're working in isolation and other local authority areas have got a small amount of LSOs but they're working in a network of others who provide that assistance. We need to kind of make sure we're, we're comparing apples with apples when we look at the number of LSOs that there are. So anyone's got information on that, not just now, but that would be quite helpful, I think, to the committee. A, a very patient Jenny Goldruth next. Thank you, convener. Not often called that. Um, 
With regard to the involvement of uh, young people uh, in the licensing process, it was quite struck, Stuart Wilson, at the beginning. You mentioned uh, it was a difficulty that you faced. Um, and I think Chief Inspector, you alluded to that as well. And I note, Roger Colker, in, in your submission, in terms of public accessibility, um, you say, in theory, meetings of the Edinburgh Licensing Forum are held in public. In practice, its meetings are always held during the working day and are not webcast, so excluding anyone who has a full-time job with normal hours. Um, I wonder, then, what the panel's view is with regard to getting greater community engagement in the licensing process more broadly, but also particularly in terms of tackling that public health causal link and actually, I suppose, tackling behaviour change, how you get the views of young people involved in the system, particularly with regard to it being the year of young people? Maybe start with Mr Colkett in that and then we'll, we'll widen it out because you were, you were mentioned there, Mr Colkett. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I'm very aware of because quite often I'm, I'm called on to deputised for somebody on the licensing forum who can't attend because he's working or um, un unavailable. Um, and I never see, I think we have a, uh, we do have a named person on the licensing forum, a young person. I can't remember the last time I was there that that person was in attendance. So yeah, that's a problem, not just for young people, but mm. yeah, everybody. Okay, so it resonates with yourself, that, that, that comment. Uh, Mary Miller? Um, on the, the local licensing forum in Glasgow, we have uh, the NUS student representative, but in terms of policy development, uh, our licensing board actually went out to meet with secondary school pupils to hear their views directly on a uh, licensing policy, because obviously with the licensing objective being extended from children to include young persons, it's important for the development of this policy that we actually take into account the views of young people. So the licensing board met with um, fifth and sixth year modern studies pupils to hear their views, and there's been some really interesting suggestions put forward that I know the board are going to take into account when it, when it develops its new policy statement. So we've actually gone out to them rather than waiting for them to come into us. Okay, thank you. Susan Elliott? Yeah, we echo the problems that we've had in terms of getting young people representation and we've had various different organisations, so community learning and development have come along to try and represent young people's views. Um, we also did a separate piece of work, community engagement work, around alcohol and impact in an area that was deprived and had high levels of alcohol-related hospital and um, death rates. And from that work, the young people were saying that they had particular concerns around an event, a community event that happened annually. So from based on that, those community engagement events, we were they were able, the young people, to actually put forward um, some views to the licensing board about the layout and operation of that event. And it changed the following year alongside some work around proxy purchase and in particular with the new legislation around supply to young people. So it is difficult and, and it's interesting the work that you're doing around modern studies and I'll, I'll take that back to our local area. But um, and, and it's not just young people's views as well, there's other areas. Okay, Laura Mann. I think community engagement and public participation in the licensing system has been of one of the top priority concerns for for us for a long time and for many of the, the partners involved in licensing and efforts are being made. There's some really interesting examples of innovative practice on the part of boards, but it's a, it's a kind of double-edged sword because on the one hand, communities are not in receipt of the mandatory training that many members of the licensing community are. Um, so their ability to engage in a meaningful way is somewhat limited. AFS has tried over the last few years actually working with um, communities in Edinburgh to produce a kind of community toolkit that explains the licensing system in hopefully straightforward terms to help people engage. But the other side of that sword is that the feedback we get from communities is that the, the licensing system itself, in some cases, not all cases, but certainly in the bigger cities, can be seen to be very intimidating for members of the community. Meetings are often held in very formal rooms of the council chambers, and there's a very kind of formalised process to the to the hearings that, for some people, they, they just really struggle to, to participate in that. I know myself, having been to visit a few of them, that... I do quite a lot of public speaking, but I find it quite intimidating. Yeah. So for somebody on a community committee or, or a licensing forum, I can imagine that that, mm -hmm. that is very, very difficult to engage in. And so we have been providing some uh, information and guidance to boards about things that they can do. And the 
the exercise that Mary's describing is exactly the kind of thing we're trying to encourage boards and forums to do, is that proactive, less formal engagement to try and gather the views of, of the different constituent <coughs> interests as far as possible. But again, that talks to the resources of the teams and of the boards and, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's another, another pressure uh, for them. Jenny Gorriff, you want to follow up? No, thank that? you, that's very helpful. Okay, and uh, the final line of questioning from Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Just to be brief, actually, Camilla, first of all, apologies for being uh, late uh, um, on arrival uh, this morning. I think one of the things that um, everyone would agree on is that we really need a definitive, objective criteria as to what over provision is. So I think that's something that's definitely come out this morning. But the point I was wanting to just um, mention was the, the issue that Mr. Shearer and Mr. Colcott brought up earlier on, which was really about supermarkets. I mean, I've been to a number of countries over the years where they have completely separate checkouts for alcohol and that stops the kind of um you know um you know people going in and just uh, you know um buying a bottle of wine or whatever on spec that they hadn't thought of people actually have to buy all their goods all their non-alcoholic goods uh, at one set of tills and then they have to literally go back into the shop and then go through another set of tills and a lot of people just say Oh, do you know what I'll do it next week? And the impact on consumption is quite considerable. It doesn't impact on the issue of over provision. You still have the same number of outlets, so uh, but you actually reduce consumption quite considerably, and that, that that's something I think it should be looked at. There's obviously issues there in terms of uh, smaller um, retailers. Clearly, who, who that might not be possible for, but certainly for larger supermarkets, it's worked in a, a swathe of countries across Europe um, and also places like Canada and um, Australia. And I think it's something that uh, we should be looking at uh, uh, delivering here because I think we can get all the health benefits and all the alcohol reduction benefits, um, but without having to argue about provision in a way, ironically, because uh, you're not actually taking the provision away. You're just having to make, it just means that people have to make more effort if they want to buy alcohol, and that itself reduces consumption. Okay. I think I'm going to take comments. On, on that, I think that's, that's really important. Can we kind of wrap that up with a couple of other things? Maybe get some fi finishing comments as well from from witnesses. Um, sure. It, um, Clark just drew to our attention that probably it would be remiss of us not to ask a, a question. We roll two or three things up together. And if you want to ignore all of these, that's up to you, but you can make a final comment as well, and, and that that will take us home. Uh, one of the biggest aspects of alienation from communities in relation to uh, the licensing process is quite often a lot of objections come in, but they're, ne they're not ne necessarily relevant to the licensing objectives. Um, so there's a mismatch there, and that can disillusion a lot of people, and they withdraw from that level of participation. So I'll leave that sitting there. So if that's something you particularly want to say in your, your final comments, please do that. And, uh, and the, the, uh, I'm not trying to dilute the comments Mr Gibson made, I'm just trying to make sure that people get the opportunity to to look at the completeness of the lines of questions we had. And Mr Lee, I think, w w was talking about the licensing forum and the balance in relation to over-provision and other things they might do. And you mentioned a few things you'd quite like them to do. And we got some comments to say that might not necessarily be in line with the five licensing objectives that the licensing forum has. That that confused me a little bit, because I would have thought things like talking about test purchasing or bottle tracking and all that kind of thing or public disorder would fit in, for example, with protecting and improving public health or protecting young children, young people from harm. So does that bring us back to definitions again and guidance in relation to what do those objectives actually mean in practice? I know there's three things there, uh, and I think at the core of it was Mr Gibson <coughs> talking about other tools we have in the box to reduce consumption separate from over-provision as well. So we've got about five minutes left before we close this session. I know there was a lot in that, but this will be your final opportunity to come in, Laura Mann. Um, so, responding to uh, Mr Gibson's comments, I think we would completely agree that there needs to be a wider look at availability and everybody should be clear that over-provision and the licensing system is not the only answer to the issue of availability. Actually, what the licensing system can achieve at this time is relatively limited. We are simply talking about, through over-provision assessments, potentially placing a cap on licenses in particular areas. What the licensing system does very well is put the controls in place around the operation of those premises. So it's a significant contributor, but it shouldn't be seen as the answer to all alcohol availability problems. Um, 
certainly things like separate checkouts um, and, and other measures to try and we, we talk about limiting accessibility because I think when you're talking about making people make a more conscious decision about going to buy alcohol it's not about making it less available it's just changing the access but there is good evidence to show that that does make a, a positive contribution to reducing harm so we would agree with that and we have actually made recommendations to the Scottish Government that with this new alcohol strategy refresh we would really like to see the availability section of that strategy looking more widely at what else can be done around availability at the same time as strengthening the the um, ability of the licensing system to do what what it, what it is there on paper <coughs> for it to be able to do. Um, with regards to the objections from community members needing to be linked to the objectives, again, completely agree, and that that is partly what our community toolkit that we developed with the Edinburgh Community Councils was about. It was about trying to help communities understand that that if you're going to make an objection there are certain rules about when an objection can be taken into account so that's there is an attempt there to try and inform people and again it's it is about the information and making it clear and making it accessible and understandable to anybody that has an interest in in uh, this area the last thing i i wanted to to kind of shine a light on is the um, forthcoming production of the first set of annual functions reports. Um, so this was a new requirement brought in under the Air Weapons and Licensing Act and Alcohol Focus Scotland did a lot of lobbying around ensuring that this annual functions report was included in that legislation which is essentially an annual report from the licensing boards on how they are um, fulfilling their uh, responsibility for promoting the licensing objectives. And the reason we argued for that was to try and increase the information available to communities and to licensing forums to enable them to do their scrutinising role. So at the moment, the boards produce their policy statements, which are forward-looking uh, five-year plans, essentially, about what they're going to do. What the annual functions report should do is provide a yearly opportunity to look back at what has happened during that year and assess themselves against um, their policy. Again, unfortunately, there hasn't been guidance provided to licensing boards on how those annual functions reports should be developed, what should be contained. There's information in the Act about what it should cover, but there has been no guidance to flesh that out at all. Um, and as I say, the first ones are due in June this year. So we would be making a call for the Scottish Government to really scrutinise those first published uh, statements and engage with the communities and the forums who are the audiences essentially for that report to ensure that what is coming out is something that is useful. We don't want anybody producing something that's just burdensome and is not going to be of use to anyone. Um, so that's, that's the other it's a tool in the toolbox, I think, but again, it needs some clear guidance. Thanks for that, Laura. I'm now going to just go around to everyone, give you a final opportunity. You can answer all those three questions. You can ignore the three of them and give your final comment if it's something else that's relevant to you. But uh, we'll, 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 just, we'll just go around. So, Mary Miller. Thank you, Convener. It's just to pick up on the points you were talking about, about the, the community engagement and the licensing process. And I think there is a great deal of frustration when members of the public do put in objections to licensing applications and they perhaps, you know, they don't have that background knowledge of what the licensing objectives are. And unfortunately, it, it tends to be that there's a, a number of letters are sent in that the licensing board really can't attach any weight to because it wouldn't be sufficient to stand up to, to legal challenge. And that can be frustrating for the licensing board as well when there's a great sense that there's an overwhelming desire not to have a new premises in the area, but there's not actually the evidential basis or the, the, the objections haven't been set out in such a way that they really can attach weight to it. So with all that frustration, I really see that the, the key is to work with our community councils and our local elected members. They're really the gatekeepers to representing the views of local communities. And rather than trying to, yes, it's important that 
uh, local residents understand the licensing process, but they're not really going to become involved until there's maybe something in their particular area. So the timing of when you provide information to them can be difficult. So really trying to focus in on the community councils, local elected members, giving them the skills um, and knowledge so that they can represent their local um, residents when concerns are expressed to them about a new application or the operation of existing licensed premises. And I feel we all have a role in ensuring that there's sufficient information, toolkits or whatever um, available so that they can properly represent um, their local residents in putting forward the, the necessary evidence views or whatever that license boards can then act on that information. Thank you. And Fiona Schultz. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would agree with Mary there. It's about managing expectations. And I think the board does have a role to play there in raising awareness of what the law is, what the boards can and cannot do. Um, we're also in a position where often members of the public who do object are up against lawyers that know a lot more than they do. We're in a position as clerks that our job's to legally advise the board. LSOs can't offer legal advice, so often there's a, a floundering there. So it's about managing the expectations, raising awareness. For example, part of our um, policy consultation, Survey Monkey became very apparent that members, don't, uh, members of the public don't understand that um, licensing boards don't set the restriction on off-sale trading hours that's set under the Act. Um, the, you know, the, 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 there's not an understanding of the licensing system at all, and I think that does have to be raised. Okay, thank you. John Shearer? Yeah, just, just to mention, from a business point of view, uh, uh, the value of a licence is very important. And I think the more valuable the licence, the better run the premises. So by just keeping issuing licences all the time, of course, you dilute the value of the licence. In other countries, again, this has been seen even in taxis, etc., to improve service, improve quality, etc. We've been working very hard also on training. There's been a lot of change in the approach to training within uh, the licensing industry in general, and I think that's improved a long way. And that needs, again, a lot more work required in that, but I think that's helping, especially in licensing, etc. So the person now serving across the bar. Uh, maybe has a personal license certificate and uh, uh, they know a fair bit now about what they should do and shouldn't do. So I think that's a big improvement. But we, we, we're really, the more, you know, we haven't really touched on this yet, but if you just keep issuing licenses, of course it dilutes the value. The more, the more value that license have, has, the obvious thing would be the premises is going to be better run because uh, he doesn't want to lose a license. Okay, thank you. Stuart Nelson. I'd like to pick up on the, the raising awareness, and I would echo that, and specifically with uh, reference to local licensing forums, uh, with the exception of the MSPs present, I would suspect the level of awareness within the Scottish Parliament of forums is not desperately high, and within society nationally, the level of awareness is quite low, and there is a job to be done to make aware within society that they do exist and that they are a vehicle that local involvement uh, can happen and is a route to decision making within local government. Okay, thank you. Chief Inspector Kennedy? Just a final part on something that was mentioned earlier about whether a, a formation of a national forum. I think it's key from a policing perspective particularly. I'm sure other members will, will agree is that we absolutely need to keep the localism uh, aspect and I'm, I'm not sure if the national forum what focus it would have, we absolutely need to remember that local communities have got different requirements in relation to their needs. Okay, thank you. And Roger Colker? Um, yes, well, with regard to public engagement and public participation, I can only speak for Edinburgh, and there are definitely problems there in terms of the availability of information. Um, in fact, as, as in so many other examples, there there's no enforcement, really. I mean, the, the requirement that um, information should be made available to, get, you know, to um, local communities when a, uh, a licensing application is received, um, we, we just get a very summary uh, statement of, of, of what's required. We don't get any copy of the layout plan or the operating plan so we can't really see what's going to be going on and, and 
it's fairly easy for me because I happen to live uh, near the city chamber, so I can go down there and ask to see these documents. They're not available online. They're supposed to be provided according to the, the regulations, but they aren't. Um, and there is no easily available register of existing premises. Now, I think that's probably something specific to Edinburgh. I dare say in other areas it is available, but it isn't there. And the other thing is um, the, the intimidating format of the licensing board meetings. It's not just, as was said, you know, they occur in sort of rather overwhelming uh, circumstances like the council to him and that sort of thing, but also that I don't know whether this is required by the Act or whether it's just the way it operates in Edinburgh, but the uh, applicant um, has a copy of the objections. The objectors don't have a, a copy of what the applicant is going to say. The objector has to speak first, and then the applicant's representative, who is usually a professional lawyer or something like that who's used to this sort of thing, demolishes all that the objector has said, and the objector has no opportunity to, re to reply. And that seems to me uh, sort of uh, in defiance of natural justice, but uh, I'd be interested to know what other people f find in their own areas. Okay, thank you, Mr. Colk. Uh, Susan Elliott? Um, I would just make a plea again for forums to be reviewed because of the variance across the country. Um, just to bring that back to the attention of the committee and hopefully um, the guidance to be properly updated and consulted with the relevant stakeholders and make sure that everyone's aware of that guidance. Okay, thank you. And finally, John Lee. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thanks very much for today's opportunity. It's been a uh, really, really worthwhile engagement. Um, just to say briefly, I think um, in, in the overall debate about availability and as, as, it, as it relates to over-provision, I think there's a danger, particularly in the messaging that we hear from organisations like Alcohol Focus Scotland about the availability of alcohol. Given that alcohol is um, a, legal, a legal product, um, it's actually quite, quite closely controlled. It can only be sold from a, um, a, a licensed premises. It can only be sold at particular hours of the day. Um, the sales area has to be very specifically outlined in the operating plan. And that's very difficult for a convenience store, for example, to, um, to change that. There has to be a, a designated premises manager. That manager has to have a personal license. In Scotland, unlike the rest of the UK, there are restrictions on the advertising and the promotion of alcohol in store. Um, staff in Scotland, again, unlike the rest of the UK, have to undergo mandatory training before they can, they can sell alcohol. Um, premises must have an age verification policy in place. Um, and now, um, I think we're the first country in the world to implement a, a national uh, minimum unit pricing, minimum unit pricing policy. So there are already um, a really wide range of, of measures to um, ensure that alcohol is sold, sold responsibly and is controlled. It's almost as if we've lost the faith in ourselves to kind of implement them fully, and, and the search is constantly for 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 other remedies. I think we should perhaps focus on. Um, making sure that all the existing measures are actually being implemented and being, being, being enforced um, effectively. Whilst I suspect that could stimulate further debate, you have the advantage, of course, Mr Lee, of being the last uh, witness to speak uh, in, in, in this round table. Uh, the, the first thing I think we'll unanimously agree that you said there was that this is a really worthwhile round table uh, discussion. It's been educational and informative for for, for for MSPs, particularly those who weren't local councillors, such as myself beforehand as well, it's been very very useful. I suspect I'm not giving any secrets away if I say there's a number of points that the committee will be acting on, and I suspect we'll return to this again. So thank you very much for everyone involved in this round table. It's been really really good value and useful uh, to committee members. So that ends agenda item one, and we'll suspend to uh, eleven fifteen, uh, where we'll start agenda item two. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We now move to agenda item two, which is uh, access and green spaces in Scotland. And the committee will hold its second round table evidence session of the day. And this time it's with a number of interested stakeholders on the impact of access and green spaces on communities and related issues. Can I welcome everyone here today who's going to give evidence? And perhaps we could go round the table and introduce ourselves, MSPs included, of course. Uh, I'll start Bob Doris, MSP, and I'm the convener of the committee. Hi, I'm Julie Proctor and I'm the Chief Executive of Green Space Scotland. Hello, Monica Lennon, MSP and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Hello, um, my name is Matt Lowther, I'm the Head of Place and Equity for NHS Health Scotland. Andy Whiteman, MSP. Uh, Colin Rennie, Scottish Manager <coughs> of Fields and Trust. Graham Simpson, MSP. Uh, good morning, Jenny Gilruth, MSP. Uh, Bruce Wilson, Acting Head of Policy at the Scottish Wildlife Trust, but speaking on behalf of Scottish Environment Link. Morning, Alexander Stewart, MSP. Kevin O'Kane, Green Space Officer, Fife Council. And I'm Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Morning, I'm John Kerr, the Chair of the Edinburgh Green Spaces Forum, representing the volunteer groups in the City of Edinburgh. OK, um, okay good morning, everyone, and thank you, everyone, for, for coming along. As uh, if you reflected in the previous session, we'll, we'll maximise the amount of time for witnesses to speak and for MSPs, not, not so much. But we'll hopefully stimulate debate in certain directions along the way. And can we go to Graham Simpson, MSP, with the first question? Um, thanks, thanks very much, convener. I think what um, pro probably sparked this uh, session today was the, the report from Green Space Scotland um, on the, the state of Scotland's green spaces. Um, I think what, what came out for me, um, and I'll just throw this out for general comment to get us started. Um, was that the, the issue doesn't seem to be so much the, the amount of green spaces, the number of parks, but the quality of those parks, which uh, appears to have gone down according to that, that report. So I just wonder, um, just to get us going, um, what people's experiences and thoughts were on that. I think it would only be fair, given you mentioned Green Space Scotland, to start with uh, Julie Proctor at this point. Julie. Thank you. Yep. I mean, that's the third State of Scotland's Green Space report that we've produced, and I think it is really important to do that biennial, triennial check on what does our green space look like, because we know green space is really important for our quality of life, our quality of place, in terms of health, play, physical activity. And what we find is we'd worked with Ordnance Survey, so we've now got a very comprehensive record of every area of green space in urban Scotland, most of the publicly accessible green space in the rest of Scotland has now been mapped. So we know absolutely how much green space we have. For those interested in numbers, it's 1,593 square kilometres. <laughs> Put that into perspective, 22 times the, the area of Loch Lomond, a third of the Cairngorms National Park. In urban Scotland, we are more green than grey. Over 50% of our urban area is green. When we look at access to green space, we actually have very good quality access to green space. Most of us live within a five minute walk. But what we found when we did the State of Scotland's Green Space Report was the real challenge is declining quality. From 2009 to 2017, we've seen a real fall in the quality of our green space. 40% of people now say their green space has deteriorated in the last five years, and that's having an impact on use as well. So what we saw in 2017 was the lowest weekly frequency of using green space that we've seen at any time in the past. And that is really important if we think about tackling issues around child obesity, health and well-being, having access to green space that feels a safe and accessible and welcoming place is important. And that's the challenge. We've seen cutbacks through local authorities cutbacks in other forms of management and we're now seeing the quality of the space deteriorate and that means we're at risk of losing those benefits. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Mr Lowther. Yes, thank you. Um, I suppose just on the point of, of quality, um, from, from a health perspective we know that um, the quality of the green space is particularly important for, for health outcomes. Um, my organisation, NHSL Scotland, is particularly interested in health inequality, so reducing the gap between um, those who um, are best off and worst off in our societies. And we know from a quality perspective that actually the people in the most deprived areas have um, the, the least amount of access to green space, and the, particularly the, the quality of those green spaces is much lower than, than the, the, the rest of com comparable communities. So the quality of green space, particularly from a health and a health inequalities perspective, is pretty significant. Okay, uh, Bruce Wilson. Yes, um, just a kind of a, a, a tour around the Scottish Environment Link organisations. Definitely, the, the strongest feeling that I had back was that 
the, the quality, again, was of high importance. And, and the kind of dinx distinction between functionless sort of green desert and high quality biodiverse space that provides a whole range of benefits, your health benefits, but also kind of sometimes overlooked benefits like flood amelioration or kind of mental, mental health benefits as, as well. Um, and then obviously the biodiversity um, side of things that is very important to our membership. Okay, any additional comments from witnesses before I go back to Mr Simpson? Mr Rennie? Yeah. Yes, uh, just to mention that we have a recently, uh, we recently commissioned a major study on revaluing parks and green spaces. It's referred to in the submission we made and it can put a, a, a value on the, uh, an economic value on uh, green spaces. It could put a well-being value uh, and it looks at the estimated savings uh, to the NHS for those who use green spaces uh, regularly. So I would uh, commend that to you. And it really invites uh, everyone to look at parks and green spaces in a completely different way. OK, thank you. No one else? Yes, Mr Kerr. Um, ju just one uh, point to reinforce on that from the, the community side. Um, the, the quality side of it is really the most important part because it, it, it's all very well having a, a green space very close to someone's front door, but, but if they don't want to go there, it's of no value whatsoever. Um, they could be, it could be 10 minutes away, it could be half an hour away, it could be a car journey away, but they, they, want, they have to go to somewhere that they actually want to try and visit and get some benefit from. Um, people use the green spaces that we have, and there are many um, for so many different reasons, and they are a tremendous benefit to health, both physical and mental, um, but they have to want to go there, so we've got to try and improve the quality if we can. Okay, Mr O'Kane? Yeah, just, um, certainly in Fife, yeah, we, so we measured the quantity of green space and the provision. There was, you know, most places had, had a good amount of space, and even places like Glenrothes had very high amounts of space. As a, as a plant new town, people were within two and a half minutes' walk of a green space. As well as you say, the, the big issue is the, uh, the quality, and certainly with Fife, we, we, there's been basically 25% reduction in the amount of money going to maintain the green spaces. So, you know, it's having an add-on effect in terms of staff, uh, and ter so the maintenance staff, and but also just, you would call the backroom staff, the staff that do the improvements. And so, so, so what's happening is the, you know, we're, we've reduced, in some respects, reduced the nice things like the flowers and shrub beds. And it's, you know, a lot, a lot of things now are going down to maintenance, uh, intensively managed grass and litter picking. So. You know, there is, there is evidence that we are we are reducing the quality. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Dr. Lowther. So I come back and I should have said. Um, I think it's important to, to understand when we talk about the quality of the green space, it's not just about making sure the grass is a certain height or, you know, we've got a certain amount of shrubs. It's about making sure the green space is right for the right communities. So I think it's just important to understand that we talk about quality. It's not just about um, yeah, grass length and other things. Mr. Simpson, do you want to follow up on some of that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, you, uh, it was you, Kevin, that uh, mentioned Glen Rothis. Um, I live in East Kilbride, which is also a new town, and of course they were uh, designed with uh, with actual specific green spaces. Um, and what I'm seeing uh, in East Kilbride is that some of those original green spaces uh, are getting run down. Uh, they're not um, having council money spent on them and uh, one or two of them one in particular is is at risk um, the council may 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 indeed want to build on it so I think there's a the, the, there is a there is a risk um, if if the money going into green spaces is 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 being cut um, then they they could they could get sold off or you know develop for something else uh, and that, of course, impacts on people's health and well-being. I think, I think it's a real, a real concern. Um, so when we look at the submission uh, from uh, Green Space Scotland, I mean, one of the ideas is that councils should have a green space strategy. I'm quite surprised that all of them don't. Um, and there should be a Scottish Green Space Innovation and Transformation Fund. So maybe throw that one out before we move on. Uh, Julie Proctor. Yeah. 
Local authorities were at one point required to produce open space strategies. Many of them have them, but they're coming up for renewal. And at the moment, the wording is should. So I think there's something here with the, the scrutiny you've been doing on the planning bill to make sure that we do ensure that local authorities have an open space strategy. It's not just about parks. It's a green network strategy. It looks at a green infrastructure perspective. And so that we are evaluating across the spaces and looking at how each is managed for the functions it needs to deliver. I think in terms of the resourcing side of things, one of the challenges you find if you look on local authority balance sheets, if you look on their asset register, you probably won't find their parks and green spaces. If you do, it might have a token value of a pound. And that's because they're measured in terms of what it costs to maintain them rather than the many benefits they deliver. So I think work like Fields in Trust, work that was done here in Edinburgh on a social return on investment study, which shows for every pound invested, you're getting 12 to 16 pound return on investment. We need to start looking at how do we value our parks and green space as an asset, a natural capital asset, rather than as a liability. I think what we've seen across Scotland is local authorities are facing challenging times, not just in green space, across every area of budget. And what we've seen is people really rise to the challenge of doing more with less. I think we've reached a challenge where they can't do that much more. But what we have seen is it's very important to find new ways of working in partnership with communities, with other organisations. So here in Edinburgh, the partnership with the Scottish Wildlife Trust on living landscapes. So how do we manage the parks to deliver benefits for people and for wildlife? And so I think that's what we like to see with a transformation fund. So for instance, work we did in, in Aberdeenshire, looking at how do we manage parks to, to mitigate and adapt to climate change. It takes a little bit of additional resource, a bit of capacity to start looking at things from a new perspective and to free up some opportunities to think a little bit differently about how we manage our parks and green space. Colin Rainey, your organisation was mentioned in that. Yes. Well. So I mentioned earlier, we, we've commissioned a, a study. Uh, the findings have just been put. In fact, they're being uh, launched in the Welsh Assembly today, and we have a Scottish launch planned. Uh, but the document is available now. Uh, and I think it is uh, taking a completely different view. I mean, parks should not be, and green space should not be viewed as a, a nice to have or good to have, but really a must have, uh, you know, if we are to tackle some of the uh, health and other. Uh, problems uh, that we have in Scotland and we know that uh, from the research we conducted that uh, people who use parks and green spaces regularly uh, live healthier lives and you know we can put a, uh, an eco a price on that uh, which uh, again allows us to view parks and green spaces in a completely different way. Okay, any other comments on the points Mr Simpson was making? Yeah, Mr uh, O'Kane? Say that it's not just councils that own you know, public green space, there's a lot of landowners that own it as well. And, and we have had instances, one of the five towns where there was a, there was a housing development in the no uh, cricket pitch and they put in uh, a bit of green space as part of the planning conditions. And it was, it was managed by a factor. And the factor's now sold it on to a private individual who's actually stopped maintaining it. So it's now become a blight on the community. I don't know whether this private landowner wants to sell it on for housing, but it's, you know, so, so it's, it's not just a council issue. There's, there's other landowners, certainly in Fife, we've got large uh, estates that own land, as, you know, public land as well. So there's, there's, there's issues with not seeing it just as a council thing. And, you know, there's, I think, as you say, I think it is a finite resource, as, as you say, even within some of the new towns where there was quite a lot of green space. But once it's, you know, it's lost, it's lost. So there is there's a big issue in uh, uh, protecting it as well. And Bruce Wilson? As uh, one of those landowners that, that has a lot of land around kind of communities, we, we, we view our reserves in different ways. Some are sort of reserves that are exclusively for sort of biodiversity, you know, maybe in some really remote Scottish islands, for example. Uh, and some that are really there for sort of public engagement, we've we've been finding a lot of pressure placed on on our kind of resource, and it's the same across other NGOs, and it must be the same for councils. Sp spread of of development, um, quite often the green space is viewed as the develop by the developer that, that that they don't own and manage as an asset because people want to move to areas so they can, you know, play with their kids, walk dogs, that kind of thing. But it does put a lot of strain on us having to maintain infrastructure. Um, try and make sure boundaries aren't eroded, um, you know, creep, creep of back gardens, that kind of thing. So there, there are definitely, um, there are huge reasons to encourage uh, 
good access but kind of responsible access and possibly thinking about what developers that are benefiting from housing development can do to, to help maintain that, that asset. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Dr Lowther. Um, yeah, and just on the back of that, the NHS, of course, is a significant landowner. landowner. And I, th I think, um, on the back of what Julie was saying, I think there needs to be a, a, a shift in attitudes towards our land, particularly green spaces. So seeing them as real assets, so seeing as things that can really be of value as opposed to just things that are deficits that, that are costing the money. And I think that goes for the NHS as well as local authorities as well as other landowners. There'll be lots of opportunities for witnesses to come back in. Anything else specific on this point before we move to our next question from MSPs? No, uh, Jenny Goldruth. Yeah, um, just like to, to follow on from Graeme Simpson, really, um, uh, as the constituency MSP for Glenrothes, um, and I'm sure that Kevin O'Kane will not be surprised to hear it. I, I really was interested in Dr Matt Lowther's point at the beginning when he spoke about um, the link to deprivation and access to green space, uh, particularly because Glenrothes faces huge problems in terms of child poverty. But it's a good news story in terms of access to green space, um, because when the town was first built, you know, there was this great utopian vision that Glenrothes would be a garden town. And um, the good air quality was used as a selling point to get people to come to the town and to settle, and they did in great numbers. But I know um, from the Fife Council audit that was conducted, um, 45 out of the 95 green spaces needed to be improved. 45 are still considered to be improving. I just wonder if you could tell us a wee bit about the other 50. Are they OK in terms of the Fife Council audit? Um, and also with regard to Dr Matt Lowther's second point, which was making sure that land is right for the right community. I know that within the Fife Council audit, um, you looked at quality. I just wonder to what extent, how was that assessed, um, the, the quality of the green space that you looked at? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we did a very detailed survey 10 years ago, and we're tr I'm trying to get funds to get it again. And, yeah. uh, we, you know, we looked at the amount of land and uh, access to land. And, yeah, I mean, Glenrothes was very interested in, like, Grimson's about East Kilbride that I think because they were so well planned, mm -hmm. they actually had a lot of space. And uh, I mean, we've, we've, I mean, the way we find it with the map and all this is, is people have two and a half minutes walk to a green space in, in Glenroth. It's probably somewhere in East Kilbride and the other new towns. So there is, there is this high high degree of access. And certainly in the new towns, they, well, there was big budgets when they were first put in. They had very good budgets to maintain and certainly, I mean, it's changed now, but certainly even 10 years ago, there was still a high budget in Glenrothes to keep it uh, very well looked after. So, you know, you have that. And then, so yeah, we, we did we did a survey about 460 green spaces in Fife and, uh, you know, we found about half of them needed to be improved. And in terms of quality, uh, green Space Scotland did a very good uh, work about 10 years ago on what we were defining what quality is. So it's it's about how attractive it is, mm -hmm. how, how you can get into the green space, the wildlife, the community and the health and well-being. So there's about six or seven different factors we looked at in terms of quality and uh, in, in terms of the green space. But yeah, in terms of the, the five green spaces, you know, some, some of these need a lot of money to improve and you know it takes time to to improve them and it's just and there's also other ones that when they they aren't owned by the council it takes longer like i'm talking about a case in one of the towns where it's a private individual on in this green space now and yeah. you know to try trying to get that changed is is, is is difficult uh so yeah so we you know so we're we're obviously trying to improve, we've improved it. And then in terms of deprivation, in terms of, you know, we, we find clear links in Levenmouth uh, where, you know, there's whole, whole communities where the, uh, the the quality of the green space was poor. And in Buckhaven, there's a community group that are working there, Clear Buckhaven, and yeah. you know, they're working there and the council's working there. But it's just, I think in, in post-industrial areas, the quality was, a lot, a lot poorer because they didn't have these town parks, and uh, so, and also with budget cuts now, it's it is a challenge to improve the quality. Uh, another thing is, we're, certainly with councils, our capital budgets have all been slashed, so just having money to repair things and improve things uh, is a challenge. And then thrown out with public, you know, there's we have a great reliance on, on trying to apply for grants. So, you know, some of these grant processes can be quite quite hard to do and take like a month. And I, it was one I was doing it, and it was 50 uh, documents had to be put into the application form. And also with funding now is that the only funds, 
they fund the upfront capital costs, but they don't put any money into the establishment costs. The Scottish Development Department, good 20 years ago, had establishment funding for them when you're setting up uh, a green space project, so there would be a 10-year funding to just get it established. So, so I think there's, there's, yeah, there's quite a lot of challenges. Okay, any other comments on that? Yeah, Julie Paul. Just a comment in relation to access to green space and deprivation. What you'll often find if you look on a quantity basis is the more deprived communities do have very large areas of green space, but when you look at it, it's often functionless, boring, green deserts, high rise standing in the middle of grass. It's not very welcoming, not somewhere you'd want to take your kids out to play, and it's not doing much for biodiversity either. And what we find in our surveys, we ask people about their expectations for green space as good places for children to play, for relaxation relaxation, physical activity. In deprived areas, people often have higher expectations that green space should be those things, but when we ask about the local reality of their green space, the ratings are much lower. So I think we've got a huge gap between expectations and reality in more deprived communities, and there is an awful lot more that we could do. I think one of the worrying things we're seeing with our survey just now is that in terms of satisfaction levels, for the very first time, we've, I suppose, closed the opportunity gap. We've now brought the figures together between all of Scotland and the 15% most deprived communities for some satisfaction ratings. And that's not because we've improved quality in the more deprived areas, it's because the quality has deteriorated across the piece. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lowther, are you wanting to come in now? Yes, please. Um, uh, just on the point of deprivation and health and the role of green space, so there's pretty good evidence now that actually if we can get this right and we can improve the quality of green spaces, and particularly in deprived areas, it can actually help reduce health inequality. So it has a bigger impact on the more deprived areas. So if we can get this right, it is something that can make a significant contribution to, to health inequalities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the other MSPs want again, but Jenny Gordon, do you want to follow up on some of that Thank before you. I let them in? So just take the MSPs in order that, that I saw them, and it was actually Miss, Mr Gibson first, so... I said very much, uh, convener. I mean, Mr O'Kane talked at the beginning about the reduction in budgets, and he talked about how the, the council has to spend a lot of the resource it has on keeping, you know, cutting grass and stuff like that and delittering. I'm just wondering, you know, I didn't really see much of it in terms of the submissions, the impact of things like dog fouling and, and littering. When I was a councillor in Glasgow, for example, the, the city council had at that time what was quite a radical idea of allowing a lot of areas to become you know, rewild effectively to attract uh, um, uh, animals, uh, birds, you know, um, insects, and of course, uh, wildflowers to grow. And all that happened, frankly, was that people began to object to it because it became a, a magnet for, you know, litter, you know, um, and the, the areas became quite unsightly. So, what, what, and obviously that affects all, all parts of Scotland um, um, pretty badly to, to one degree or another. It's a it's a thing I think is a bit of a, a shame. It's, it's shaming on the country, actually, when I see how, how much litter there is um, everywhere. But what, what impact is that having on our green spaces? Because you're talking about people's attitude to, to it, you know, like um, being, you know, more dissatisfaction than a few years ago, people less willing to use it. Do, do these issues, for dog fouling and littering, have, a, have that kind of impact? Bruce Wilson wants to come yes. in here. Very quickly come yes. back on the sort of, um, sort of rewilding yes. aspect that you call, mm -hmm. call it there. Um, I think what we've realised through our work with the Edinburgh Living Landscape and uh, the Cumbernauld Living Landscape and, and various other kind of urban initiatives that we've got is we were in the past previously not so good at explaining the rationale behind that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so people didn't get it and they thought it was neglect. So we now spend a lot of time uh, interpretation, that kind of thing, taking community groups out and then also working with friends of groups, um, particularly in Cumbernauld, there's, there's uh, 12 different friends of uh, parks that we work with to explain the rationale behind that kind of decision. It, it saves money, but also uh, things like flooding, biodiversity, it helps towards. So, so we have made some some sort of quite big strides ahead in, in that sort of area. Um, and just on your point about kind of other pressures on, on urban areas, dog fouling is certainly one, but increasingly uh, industrial dumping, um, mm -hmm. asbestos, horses, um, you name it, we'll, we're going to get it on reserves. So it's definitely a pressure. Okay, Kevin, okay. Yeah, just on, on you're talking about the rewilding again. It, you know, you can't just left leave things alone. Uh, you know, because actually you do need you need to maintain all the, the public green space. So yeah, the, some councils have, have tried to just cut stop cutting the grass, but you still need to do the litter. And also, if you want to make it better for wildlife, you actually have to cut the grass about two or three times. 
So, so you know, there's a even in that sort of aspect, it does need money to maintain. You just can't abandon it. If you abandon it, then it just becomes a blight. Yeah. And you know, so I think that's the main part of that. Okay. Yeah, I think just to commend work like the Living Landscapes project, because there have been a lot of places where they tried to change the grass cutting regime, as Bruce says, without any communication, and it was just interpreted as money saving. Um, but it isn't, it needs to be a planned approach. And so a lot of the experience from Edinburgh has been shared in other places. If we're up in Fife and we went to Dunfermline, you'd see in Dunfermline Public Park, where our young place changes, young people had been working with the community council there. That's changed the management regime. Regime. But what they do is there is there are wilder areas left, but there are always paths cut through the grass. The edges is always managed, so it looks as though it's a managed space. So it's delivering benefits for people and biodiversity as well. And I think that's important. And one of the things I was going to say is there's a lot of opportunities now to share practice across different local authorities. So we have a park managers forum which brings all 32 local authorities together because I think each council is facing these very similar challenges and there's a lot they can learn from each other. Okay, any additional comments on that before I go to, to, to other members? Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Mina, we've touched on funding and expenditure and there's a vast variation across Scotland depending on what local council's priorities are. Uh, but what has happened in recent years is the, the partnership working. And I'd like to maybe expand a little bit on that, where you have the, the Bloom committees or you have communities uh, that take on ownership uh, or you've even got trusts that now look after parks or look after space. That is seemingly the way forward uh, to try and fill that gap that you have, uh, ensuring that there is still uh, some ownership of the organisation uh, within the community, but also the funding is looked at out of a different stream. Uh, has, how has that improved the situation? Uh, who would like to go first now? Uh, Mr O'Kane? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have certainly, there's, there's been some of our parks and green spaces have been taken over by uh, some trusts and community groups. What I would say is, uh, I suppose it'll, it helps, but I suppose it's not, it's not addressing everything because it's just the scale of the cuts have, have, have changed the whole, you say, the landscape. And then sometimes you can get situation where the you know the trust can't we, we've had to take back parks so I mean we we, we we have 60 emblem groups in Fife and you know they're very important and there's a lot of community capacity building and and improving the, improving the towns and villages but I think it's it's one aspect and certainly in Fife we we're very active in doing it but you know it's, it's I think I think because of this the amount of public green space we have and, and the need for it uh, you know, it's, it's one element of the equation. Okay, any other? Julie Proctor. Yes. Yeah. And John will probably want to have some comment on this around, well, around the role of friends groups. But I think what we saw from the survey that we did in 2017 was a significant increase in people wanting to have more of a say about what happens in their green space and to get actively involved in physical activities, tasks within the site to improve it. But what we didn't find was any significant appetite in terms of ownership of title of the land. And the Heritage Lottery Fund found something very similar when they did their State of Parks report. Um, um, fewer than 10% of the friends groups who are actively involved in managing sites wanted to take on a lease or a more formal arrangement. And there were concerns about liabilities and insurance and so on that went alongside that. And I think what we have seen, is, although there is a strong focus at the moment on community empowerment, we haven't seen the scale of interest in community buyouts and transfers in urban Scotland that we've seen in more rural and highland areas. And one of the biggest challenges we've seen is groups, green space groups who've looked at that, they haven't been able to find any way of developing a sustainable income stream from parks and green spaces. So they don't have any way of resourcing those costs on an ongoing basis. It's something we're actively looking at and I would hope a transformation and innovation fund could assist with. So we're looking now at opportunities to generate heat and energy from our parks and green spaces. So are there ways that they can start to generate income so that that could then actually come back into a community fund, energy generated locally, used locally, the funding coming back into the community groups to resource improvements in, in the site. So a virtuous circle. But I think John's got a lot of practical experience from the friends groups. Um, yeah. uh, you've got lots of interest there, including <laughs> from myself, but I'll restrain myself, particularly in friends groups. I really want to ask a specific question. Bruce Wilson. And, um, friends groups are invaluable for our being our communication from sort of like an NGO 
uh, who can sometimes seem quite faceless to local community, I think, to, to kind of us having local staff on the ground that can that can uh, speak to these friends groups. So they are completely invaluable from, from getting messages out to the community. The grass is a great example, but, but there are numerous other things as well. Okay, thank you. And John Kerr? Yeah. Um, as, as the representative of friends groups, I've never felt so loved as I do at present. <laughs> um, I, I think that a lot of the people in friends groups started off thinking they could do something about tidying up the park and making it a better place to visit and so on. And now they've also become experts in public liability insurance, risk assessments, health and safety, currently wrestling with GDPR, um, becoming a registered charity to encourage funding, um, how to apply for funding. I mean, so many things that you're doing now in addition to the basic things that you thought you might be doing as a, as a, as a friend of your park. Um, the, th the thought of taking on ownership as well is, I think, for a lot of groups, just a step too far. Um, it, it's a big responsibility to take on. Um, many of the, the, the representatives and friends groups aren't exactly the youngest people on the planet. Many of them are, and apologies to them, <sighs> but ma many of them are older. Um, and, and to take on that extra work is just not something that they're prepared to consider at this time. Can we come back to you on that, Colin Rennie? Yeah, just following in from John's point, our charity takes the view that local authorities will always have the most important central role in, in providing and maintaining green spaces. And we take the view not all transfers are good. I mean, let me give you one example, or it happens rather often, where football teams successfully take over a pitch. The problem is, if the, the ground on which the pitch sits isn't a lot bigger than the pitch, they want to fence the pitch off. So it excludes everyone else. And unfortunately, sometimes football teams only see the pitch as a pitch, but it's often the place where kids learn to kick a ball, hit a ball with a bat, learn to ride a bike. So it plays a, it's actually works enormously well uh, where pitches are not fenced off. When there's a game on, no one walks a dog across the pitch. Uh, but the minute the game's finished, you know, the park is open to all. Uh, so there are, uh, as we see it sometimes, uh, difficulties with transfer where it's, uh, you know, it takes a large space on quite a small area. Okay. I'll just indulge slightly here because I'd mentioned I'd wanted to come in as well in relation to friends of groups and it's, I mean so in my my constituency they're invaluable and thank goodness they exist but I mean I, I would look at friends of groups and the role they do is going way beyond austerity of the last few years so friends of Mary Hill Park have not ownership they've got direct use of much of the park but it, it's a long time now before austerity when the tennis courts in the park closed when the bowling green closed when the athletics uh, park fell into abeyance, so there's been a, a there appears to be a long term managed decline of some of these assets. And friends of Mary Hill Park have stepped in during difficult financial times and are doing amazing work there that goes beyond the park, including community arts um, initiatives in the local area as well. I mention uh, friends of Springburn Park, who the, their new community village is going to open up within the park in the second and third of June wonderful initiative. I have to say in partnership with the local authority, I'm not trying to criticise local authorities, but there has been a long-term managed decline of, of many parks. Sad to see of that in Glasgow, given that's a real jewel in the crown of Glasgow, particularly the parts out with um, the more affluent areas have certainly seen a rundown, and the friends of groups in my constituency do an invaluable role. So when we're talking about how, how we support parks and open spaces, I'm just wondering whether we any innovation fund, for example, is it to support community resilience with friends of organisations? Is it to, to stop the decline uh, elsewhere, out with an urban setting where uh, inequalities have only closed because I feel like nicer assets are now starting to deteriorate as well? Um, where, where, where would we spend, if there was money to spend supporting community resilience to access to open spaces, my money would be in supporting the friends of groups because that's a volunteer-led uh, uh, groups in my constituency who do a wonderful job. We can't spend money everywhere, so if you had a priority, what would you support? Mr Kerr, it's only fair to come to yourself just, first. I think just to sort of pick up on that, that I, I would support trying to encourage new groups. Um, you know, there are a lot of very um, well-established groups you know, throughout Scotland. Um, within the, the less wealthy areas, there are fewer friends of groups, and it's how you get more of these groups starting up, how do you encourage that community interest? Okay. Um, yeah, th thank you. Uh, Julie Proctor, take a second. Yeah, Julie Proctor. Yeah. I think 
the missing voice and unfortunately the missing member of with our group here today is young people. We've been working in Dunfermline with a group of young place changers and they wanted to be here today but exams unfortunately took priority over attending a committee. Um, but I think that's another strand. When you look at friends or groups, they are generally of an older generation. And what we found is that young people are often invisible in place consultations. If they're mentioned at all, they're often seen as a problem, um, hanging around vandalism and so on. We've been working with Youth Scotland um, and a Young Place Changes programme with young people and now with Heritage Lottery Funding we're rolling that out and this is about putting young people in the lead so they're leading consultations in their communities, in their parks and in their streets and bringing forward place visions and action plans and that as we've seen in Dunfermline is really invigorating some of the friends groups and bringing in fresh ideas and new approaches so we would hope as well with an innovation fund to actually look at how we're involving people in using and managing our parks who are not the usual suspects, who are not the people using them now. Uh, other, other witnesses want to comment on that. I should point out my friends of groups are not old. <laughs> uh, but, that, but that's only because I'm going to show them footage of this particular evidence <laughs> session. Uh, any other comments on that before I go to Mr Simpson, uh, Kevin O'Kane? It was just, I mean, certainly with friends groups, they do need support too. And I mean, it, I mean, it does take council officers to help I mean, a lot of friends groups fill out the forms, application forms, even get constituted. So, you know, if there was a fund, it would. There's, you know, there's a need to actually have the supports to do that. But the other thing with, with friends groups is a lot of them burn out because they're volunteers. So, mm. you know, this chat. I mean, the, the challenge is saying, oh, we, we can rely more on the friends groups. It is that you know, there's only so many volunteers, and a lot of these people are doing, are, you know, are yeah. are in committees and maybe five committees, you know, so it's, uh, so part of that money would be, I suppose, supporting them and, and helping them with the everyday things. Okay, Mr Kerr. Yeah, just to, to pick up on that, I mean, as the, as this um, resource reduction started to bite in Edinburgh Council, it was around the time that the Edinburgh Green Spaces Forum set up to help each other. Um, you know, we, my, my group was relatively new at the time, and we had basically invented a lot of things ourselves, or reinvented a lot of things. And we thought, you know, that is really stupid. So get all of the Friends of Parts groups beginning to talk to one another and help one another so that with things like constitutions or so on, we can share that knowledge and make it easier for a new group starting up. Mm -hmm. Dr Oliver? Yeah, thanks. Just on the point of um, children and, and young people, again, I think it's just important to, to um, point out that the evidence is fairly strong that kids who use green spaces, kids grow up to be adults who use green space. So getting the involvement of kids at a young age in green space is essential, I think. So there, there, there is a life course approach. Now, staying on this theme, the, the next line of questioning could be on this as well. It's from Mr Whiteman, but a supplementary, I think, from uh, Graham Simpson in relation to this. Yeah, it's sticking to uh, friends groups, really. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking out loud, because uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier this sort of park in East Kilbride, which... Uh, was was a couple two football pitches uh, they haven't been used for that for for years definitely under threat uh, the council wants to build on it um, so one thought I'd had was well could we do an asset transfer but uh, you know listening to you and reading the the papers we've got that that seems like it might be a bit too much for people to take on so what if we formed a friends group that sounds good but are friends groups, and I don't know the answer to this, perhaps you could help me, John, um, are friends groups able to apply for funds themselves so maybe they could fund improvements to this park? Yeah, yes, they can. Yeah. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons why they become registered charities, because okay. it's then easier to, to get the funds. So, yeah, yes, they can do it. Um, and in certain instances, I think that is, that is a good way to go. Yeah. Um, it, it just depends on the area and, and the enthusiasm of the group. Okay, that's useful. Okay, um, any more in relation to this specific area before we move on? Okay, um, uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Governor. I'm not sure we're going to move on, but uh, um, I, I should note from the Green Space Scotland's report um, that came out a couple of months ago that um, of the green space in Scotland, only 4% 4, 4 is public mm -hmm. parks and gardens, 37%, well, 28% is private gardens, so put them to one side because they're not accessible. 37% uh, is amenity green space. And that's presumably that's the land outside um, offices and uh, and things like that. So I mean, the focus of attention on four percent of public parks um, 
there's there's 37 percent of that green space um and i've been in people's views on what we could do uh, about that and the other important aspect here is that you know I, I i was at the weekend visiting some community groups out at in airdrie at woodhall and Faskine, which is a big bit of green belt and with, with an old canal and stuff and in there were lots of children playing that's where they go they don't go to any of the bits of land covered in formal green space um they literally go to the land that is actually just a minute's walk from them but is in the countryside and the challenges facing the management of that are pretty profound but um it appears that that's the kind of those are the kind of places where as i say in this case young people we're finding a lot of fun and enjoyment because it's full of woods and burns and they can go fishing and all the rest of it. So is there a danger in, in focusing on green space that we neglect the green belt? Um, and what can we do about amenity green space? OK, that opens up the discussion a bit, I think. Uh, Julie Proctor. That brings us into the thorny definition of what is green space. And I can honestly say that this was one of the longest discussion items the Green Space Scotland Board ever had. And our definition of green space is all vegetated land and water in the urban environment. So from our perspective, when I'm talking green space here, I'm not just talking about parks. Mm -hmm. I am talking very much about the amenity spaces, the allotments, the community gardens, the woodlands. And it's that whole plethora of different green space which gives the variety, which meets people's needs. Some days it might be a formal playing field to play a game of football, a park for a picnic with friends, but other times it is a walk in the woodland, it's a walk down um, a canal towpath. So that amenity space is important. And you're right, the definition of that is it's the spaces, the incidental grass spaces that might be around buildings. It could be quite large swathes of grass, it could be at the areas around um, offices, roadside verges as well and it actually all has a potential role some of it does actually have play equipment path seats so it actually functions more as a park um, and so I do think we need to be looking across that whole um, type of different green space and that's where some of the challenges come in about one size fits all in terms of quality because the type of management that you need in a woodland area a wild woodland area is slightly different to what you'd want in in a formal park so I think we need to encourage look at all of those and then when we start to look at green networks and from an ecological perspective it's that diversity that comes in and at that point even private gardens are important because if we're looking at how we're we managing flooding and air quality that green fabric is important as well. Uh, Ms. Wilson? Um, yeah, we've got often talk about uh, this concept of nature deficit disorder in children and really not growing up in, in natural spaces because yeah, there is sometimes a problem with when they do have green spaces available that they're that they're not necessarily the wildest uh, places they can visit. So I'm really pleased to hear you saying they were <laughs> playing in the in the, the place place nearby. The other thing that that makes me happy about is I'm really conscious of the, this kind of um, concept. Sometimes we have in Scotland that, that wild spaces are are a place to be driven to. You know, like maybe at the weekend you might you might go up to the campsies or you know something like that rather than having it on your doorstep. So that disconnect, I think we're, we're really keen to try and try and break. Um, and our definition certainly includes kind of that wilder aspect for, for green space as well. You, you just to be clear, I mean, the place I was talking about the children were playing was not green space as defined by the agenda we've got here. Yep. It was green belt on the edge of the settlement. So we would definitely... And that was far, far more valuable to them than anything in their community. I'd completely agree with that. Yeah. It, 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 I, think it, I think its value increases immensely when it, when it is including those kind of wilder aspects, and sometimes that means that it's, it's not managed as intensively. Okay. What interesting question. Mr. Lucia, I think interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think definition has, has been a big problem because with terms of green space, uh, you know, because certainly with new housing developments... They can put in some land that's, you know, that's not accessible to people. I mean, we came up with a, a definition of publicly usable green space. It was the land for communities, and then the other types of green space, like the verges and business estates, was functional green space. Just to sort of clarify that, we need to protect the publicly usable green space. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole thing about children's play. I mean, we. We we have we have four hundred and fifty play parks in five and five council manages, and a lot of them are in you know not great position and quality. And you're trying to say to communities that 
really, if we we take out a couple of the play parks and improve one of the play parks, uh, you know, that would be better for the community. But the community are sort of fixated thinking that plays to do with, you know, a play park, whereas you say the natural spaces can be as highly valuable. I suppose the other thing with the natural spaces then is it's you find that they're, they're not as maintained as well, and there can be anti-social, there can be litter and, uh, you know, you know, there's litter and, and, and those sort of spaces. So the other thing is we, we have developed this green networks in terms of the land use planning system and looking at green space and the natural space and how these networks are in and around the towns. And uh, that's quite valuable in terms of protection and looking at the links, because I think the big, big issue is actually, is a bit like in ecology you call fragmentation, but if you can have an interconnected network of green spaces, it's really valuable then, and it can it can then have a big massive impact then if you want cycling and walking, and even for flooding. So uh, I think you know the countryside around towns can you know can be as valuable. But I think the green, sp I think the other thing, the big point is that if you the closer they are, the more more space you'll use. So if you're sort of the World Health Organization says if you're within less than ten minutes walk, you will use the green space more regularly. But it says it's going back to quality. Yeah, different ages use green spaces in different ways. Colin Rennie, yeah. I think the type of uh, green space where you're talking about kids playing shouldn't be, you know, that concept is easy, easily creatable uh, in an urban setting, in a, a big park. And increasingly, the nature of the play areas for children reflect that. I mean, I think no longer is it recognised in play sector that things like swings, roundabouts, and a shoot, you know, fill the criteria. They're much more reflective of the sort of thing you explain you find on the edge of towns. And, I, uh, you know, I think that's increasingly recognised and increasingly more attractive. It's more challenging for kids, and it's something, it seems, that is being rolled out. But again, as a consequence of the financial challenges that local authorities have, it's been rolled out at a very slow pace. I feel that's something I want to go into as well. It's part of our budget scrutiny, which we're trying to embed in all the evidence sessions that we do. But Julie Proctor, did you want... Uh, oh, right, excellent. Uh, now, I'll take you in, Mr Simpson, but it was Mr White's line of inquiry. So, so, is it a supplementary in relation t to this? Uh, no, no um, let uh, okay. Mr Whiteman continue. Whiteman. Uh, no, I've got nothing further to add. <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> it just... It just strikes me if we are... And I think we should be improving the planning environment, resourcing how and who manages these spaces... Um, a lot to get more out of them and improve the quality. Uh, I'm just merely observing that, you know, in an area I visited, it it, it wasn't any of these designated. The, the nearest they had was the countryside, which was on the edge of the village, and that countryside is under threat. Uh, but that's producing a much higher quality environment as green belt for folk to play and walk and recreate in than anything that's embedded within the definition of the urban footprint. So in a sense, if we're looking at quality green space, and the countryside is green space, um, there's maybe an argument for having a slightly more integrated approach than just drawing a hard line and saying everything inside has a particular approach and the countryside has a slightly different approach. Okay, Julie Proctor, do you want to come in? I think I just was keen to introduce the concept of outdoor nurseries into the conversation as well and potential opportunities that might be coming forward with the um, commitment to increase the number of childcare hours. We're doing some work with Inspiring Scotland and held a roundtable um, back in February. And again, that was looking at opportunities that nursery provision doesn't have to be in a built environment, as Graham was talking around around putting a building on a park. But we've seen the Scandinavian model, there's a number of nature kindergartens. And actually, wouldn't that be quite interesting if a large proportion of the extra hours childcare provision could be met with outdoor nurseries? And again, there's quite an, an element of um, documented research in terms of the health benefits, children's future behaviours of that. So we could actually be making our parks and our green spaces work much harder as an outdoor nursery. Mm -hmm. I, I apologise to committee members and witnesses, but now that you've said that, Julie Proctor, I can't not mention Mary Hill Mobile Crash, which is a <laughs> yes. wonderful 
an absolutely wonderful outdoor mm. nursery which has gone through a period of expansion mm. it, partly because of the reasons you made and just that mindset the kids go there prepared to go outside mm. unless it's unsafe and they bring clothes accordingly and they love it mm. and there's huge demand for it so I'm really mm. really glad you raised mm. that point and apologies again for, for <laughs> indulging uh, Monica Lennon Thanks, convener. I wanted to pick up on planning. Um, this committee spent a lot of time in recent weeks and months uh, scrutinising the planning bill and some of you, I think, have made submissions to that. So it's really just to open up to witnesses, what could the, the planning system do differently? Oh, we've got a show of hands already. <laughs> uh, what could the planning system do differently to um, make sure that we do have high quality green space uh, and, and more of it and is there anything in the particular in the planning bill in front of the, the parliament that you'd maybe like to see amendments coming forward and I think Bruce Wilson is keen to get started. Well, I, I am not unsurprised that Bruce Wilson wants to answer this <laughs> question. I'll come to you first Bruce. Uh, 29th of this month is our stage one debate uh, for, for, for the parliament so just to make people aware of that. Uh, and I suspect if we only dwell on this subject of extending the meeting to about 5pm this afternoon, <laughs> but it's I'll only right that you take your opportunity. So, Mr Wilson? I'll be really brief then. Daphne's already supplied kind of uh, various amendments. She actually told me about the, the next stage uh, this morning, so that's fantastic. Um, I think we could simplify a lot of it by saying a lot of uh, statements made within planning to do with green space, uh, green infrastructure, green networks are very often shoulds. Uh, and not musts, so it quite often gets left at the end of a process. Uh, the developer should pay due attention to uh, connected green networks, that kind of thing, and not must. Um, you've got our amendments uh, that you know, we've kind of suggested on, on the planning bill, but specifically we're, we're very worried uh, about loss of supplementary guidance uh, in, in this respect. So that's, that's probably the, the main thing I'd say in regard to this. Thank you. Any uh, other, Julie Proctor? Yeah, I would just completely echo Bruce's comments about the concern around loss of supplementary planning guidance. That's certainly um, what most local authorities and friends groups have been talking to us about. Um, we'd be looking for a duty to produce an open space strategy. We welcome the references to green infrastructure in there, but most of the, the guidance, the policy that's happening at a local level is in the supplementary planning guidance, and it's essential that that isn't lost within the new planning bill. Okay. Any comments specific to planning, uh, Colin Rennie? Yeah, the, the current planning system has a statutory consultation process uh, in terms of playing fields uh, with Sports Scotland. Uh, and I think that in itself has quite a lot of limitations because when a playing field is threatened to development, Sports Scotland only look at it from the perspective of its sports use. You know, whether it's a football pitch, a rugby cricket, or cricket pitch. You know, do we need this site as a cricket pitch? There is no look at how the site is used beyond that. So, but we do have that statutory process. And I beg the question, might it be useful to have a statutory process for other green spaces to engage with uh, interested organisations uh, before a site is developed? Because we generally take the view that it's far too easy for local authorities to develop spaces they own that are zoned for green space in breach of their own local development plan and in breach of... Scottish planning policy, which has presumption. I think the spirit and intention is good. Application is slightly different. Uh, I think, as Bruce said, too many uh, shoulds and not enough musts because there is a presumption against development. If you develop, you should replace. That rarely happens. And Kevin O'Kane? I would say, certainly in my experience of the plan system and development planning in Fife, that it is actually quite good at protecting green space. I mean, there, there, is, a, there is a rigorous approach and you know, it has. I would say that the quantity would well, need to do more, but the quantity hasn't dramatically gone down in terms of five. Said so it's the quality is a big issue. Uh, I suppose it, one of the things is a lot of the plants is very much based on sites. And if you take go back to the, the way of the new towns, which the great thing about new towns was that we planned the whole new town and and the, and the spaces in new town. So you actually got a really good integrated network of spaces, whereas Certainly the way planning is now, it's very much on the site and the site within the red boundary and not what's with outside the site and linking it to other green spaces. So certainly, you know, there's, you know, if, if you can, if you could take a better approach where, where we are integrating and looking at networking connections, it, it helps. And I think in terms of, in terms of green spaces, the, 
the quantity is quite important in terms of public health. So having large spaces, uh, you know, is is better for people's health and if they're connected. So the problem with a lot of social housing and and private housing is that you know it's every space is is important for a house or and it and, and there is problems actually providing green space uh, and a lot of new housing developments. So. I suppose again, back to the supplementary planning guidance is really essential for laying out a lot of this uh, in terms of quantity and and then it's the development system in terms of actually structuring the networks and where we should because there's a lot there's a lot of fragmentation and if we can actually get more uh, connections, then it's better for walking and cycling. For members of the public who maybe haven't engaged with this to the level the committee has. not Witness around here has much of that is in the, the committee's uh, stage one report, which is available uh, on, on the committee webpage as well. Any additional comments in relation to planning before Monica comes back in? Maybe ask a supplementary on that. Oh, sorry, Bruce. I mean, just, uh, introduce the sort of the concept of the national ecological network that that we've we've also um, kind of alluded to the importance of of connectivity, um, but specifically for biodiversity, that's absolutely vital. So some kind of overarching strategy um, that kind of gives the same level strategic uh, planning to our green and blue infrastructure as we already have for kind of our other networks like you know motorways or digital networks um, would be enormously helpful. Thank you. Monica, do you want to come back in any of that? Yeah, just to pick up with Julie and Kevin, because you both mentioned supplementary guidance. If supplementary guidance doesn't survive in its, its current forum, um, do you see a way to, to include that into local development plans, which could be going to a 10 year cycle? Um, if, it, if it disappears, where else would you do that, that kind of work? Okay, Julie, do you want to come first? Yeah. I think it's also looking at what can actually be included in the planning bill. So it's actually setting that as the national framework so that that feeds down and influences locally. I mean, Kevin's probably closer to the local authority side in terms of what you would do without supplementary planning guidance. Kevin, okay. okay. I suppose I'm not, I'm not a, a you know planner, so I can't I can't totally say. But certainly, it's the you know in our local development plan, we've got supplementary guidance, uh, make advice places, and that's been really good at setting out. Uh, you know, not just looking at sites, but looking at networks. And I suppose if if it's not nationally, then I suppose it's the onus is then on the local authority to keep planning guidance. But, but certainly it's been it's been very very important in terms of green space. Okay, much more of that, of course, in, in the report. Graham Simpson, do you want to come in? Yeah, um, it was really a, a, a couple of questions for for, for yourself, Colin. Um, so field, Fields and Trust um, have a legal agreement with Glasgow City Council. With most local authorities, yes. With yeah. most local authorities yeah. as well. And uh, well, that's interesting because it says well, it says here. Uh, uh, you, you've got an agreement to protect 27 of the parks in Glasgow. That's Field and Trust have an agreement um, to secure those areas for recreation. Are you saying you've got an agreement with... We've those? got agreements all across Scotland, okay. uh, with all local authorities except one. Uh, it's a kind of nebulous concept. It's a legal agreement we have that protects the site in perpetuity. I guess if I were to draw a parallel that kind of explains what we do, we do for parks, green spaces and playing fields, what the listed building process does for architecturally important and historic buildings. There is a, we don't own them, there is a legal agreement that protects them uh, and they cannot be developed. And occasionally, you know, local authorities come to us where we've protected a site maybe for decades and say we need to widen the road. We do have a process for dealing with that. Okay. How we deal with it is strictly in line with Scottish planning policy, except where it says it should be replaced. With us, it must be. So there's never uh, any less or, uh, you know, less quality or less space uh, than there was before. But yes, we roll out legal agreements all across Scotland. It's the main thing we do is, is protect uh, green spaces for the benefit of uh, the user group. Is it easy to find out where these Yes, it is. Uh, simply put in a postcode of any part of the country and it will throw up the... Uh, on, on our on, website. On your website. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's a postcode. When you open the page, you, it's got a postcode site locator that we protect. Simply put in a postcode and the dozen or so sites nearest that postcode will come up. Okay. And is it easy to to get new new parks uh, put under one of these? 
uh, we'd like it to be easier, but yes, we, we work in partnership with most local authorities in a very productive way. Uh, and we've had different programmes at different uh, times. Okay. Uh, we currently have one, you know, this is a centenary of uh, uh, World War I, and we've got a programme with sites linked to that currently. The, the, the other question was also in, in, in your evidence, um, but other, others may want to comment on it. You, you've mentioned that uh, down south there's a parks action group, uh -huh. uh, and you're calling for that here. So I wonder if you could explain right, why, why that is. Right, the Westminster Parliament, which has responsibility for green spaces in England only, uh -huh. uh, they had an inquiry into the future of parks, uh, and... Following on from that, they established the Parks Action Group. And I guess, although a lot of good and important things have been said today, is today sufficient time to look at you know, the challenges uh, of parks and that we have with parks and green spaces, uh, to fully assess their importance in terms of links to health and well-being? I suspect not. So it may be for the committee to consider whether uh, you know, there is a... Uh, it would be a good thing to, you know, to, to have a, a, a wider, uh, more, uh, you know, more time allocated to this whole process, and, uh, you know, to make a decision arising from that whether a, a parallel organised uh, group ought to be set up for Scotland. Could ask what others think. Mm -hmm. Julie Proctor. Yeah, I mean, we would certainly encourage the committee um, after today to take a longer look at the whole issue of access to quality and um, parks and green spaces and how we can actually make sure they do deliver on the rhetoric. I think if we look um, at in Scotland, we've probably got a better national policy framework for green space than anywhere else in the UK. There is, though, a gap between what happens and how it gets lost in translation, between the aspirations, the ambition of national policy, the aspirations of local communities, and what people actually experience on the ground. And I think we do see this really as a strong area of preventative spend. You know, where spending money on green space is delivering huge benefits in terms of our health, in terms of our children's education and play and future. So I think there is an opportunity to look at, are we doing this right in Scotland? And I think also an opportunity to get ahead of what's happening in England and Wales. I mean, if we see what's happening down there, we're seeing councils such as Knowsley proposing selling off 19 of their parks and trying to reinvest the fund to maintain parks for the future. They had a longer, um, more in-depth inquiry through their communities and local government committee, and they've then set up a parks action group. That's also involving civil servants across a range of different departments as well as the range of organisations and they're looking at particular topics around um, financial models, around community involvement, around communication and I think there would be a really good opportunity to take a, a deeper and a broader look at what we need to do to make our green space assets for Scotland. That's a very powerful uh, sales pitch for further work for this committee. It's maybe worth just putting on the record the purpose of these round tables is just to kind of tease out uh, if and when or where we would do a, 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 a further more detailed piece of work. Um, sometimes it's a large piece of work, sometimes we'll pick one aspect of it and we'll focus on one aspect, one aspect of it and the committee will have to, will have to obviously consider that. We've got about 10 minutes or so left with a couple of, I'm kind of looking at MSPs, there was a few questions that we had prepared but we thought it would be good to ask to get some information on the record so we might just do that for the last 5-10 minute, minutes or so. Um, it was pointed out to me, well, I, should, I should know it, because I'm speaking in the Chamber tomorrow in relation to the National Performance Framework and National Outcomes, that the revised National Outcome uh, is access to green and blue space. Um, now, uh, it was not very well intentioned and might be mentioned by some members in the Chamber tomorrow, but I suppose the important thing is, once you've got the National Outcome, is how you would monitor that National Outcome. So, any suggestions in relation to how that would, would, should, should, should be monitored? I think would be quite... You don't have to have it just now. You can write back to the committee, but I think that would be quite helpful. How would, how would you monitor... Good national outcome, how would... Possibly, how would you monitor it, Julie Proctor? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as it's measured at the moment, it's from the Scottish Household Survey, which asks people about, do you live within a five-minute or a ten-minute walk? We already see there's a difference between... We ask a very similar question in the Green Space Survey only of urban residents, and we find they have less access than rural residents um, through the Scottish Household Survey. We're looking now... We're working at the moment with colleagues in Scottish Government on a much more robust way of measuring access to green space. We've got the, uh, the Ordnance Survey green space map, so we can use 
GIS, Geographic Information Systems, digital analysis to do network analysis, what we think we're going to find is that actually we probably have even better access to green space. So more of us will live within a five minute walk if we're just doing that physical measuring. And so that's where we'd really be putting in a plea to say that that national indicator should be saying it's access to quality green and blue space. And then we actually get something useful. Because as we've heard from Matt Lowther, it's not just about the quantity and the access, it's about the quality of the spaces that has an impact on our health. So we'd really be encouraging this committee to say quality needs to be in the national indicator as well. And then we'd be very keen to look at how we measure that. Would the spirit of sitting below that, there look at a series of criteria by which we would, would flesh that out. And I think the government was trying to make is a short it is possible the actual outcomes, but there's a whole layer below that. Even access to quality green space doesn't mean it's being used. So it should be access to quality green space that is then used. Because you're the best green space in the world, but if it's not used, it just kind of sits there. So any other ideas on how some of that might be monitored? Or you can contact the committee at a later date in relation to that if you've got any any comments on that. Uh, I think it would be remiss if it's not to ask, given the fact that uh, Julie Proctor mentioned a, a transformation innovation fund. That means money. We will be looking at, at budget scrutiny. Um, the first question I would ask in relation to that is some of the evidence we have is that different local, despite the fact that all local authorities appear to have been impacted by very tight budgets at a local level, some local authorities spend a lot more than others uh, in relation to access to green space and how they manage all that. Any suggestions on why some local authorities seem to do significantly better than others in the first instance before we go on to actually talk about the pounds and the pounds and pence itself? Any thoughts on that, Julie Proctor? Okay. Um, the Pat Managers Forum has had a really good look at the figures that come from the Improvement Service on spend. And I have to say, sometimes individual local authority colleagues didn't recognise those figures. So I think um, then maybe isn't a standardised approach. Okay. And it's a challenge in terms of when you're looking at the definition of green space, what has people included, have they included cleansing, and so on as well. So I think there is quite a variety, but it sometimes does reflect the amount of green space they have, um, the distribution of those spaces, but it's also what is recorded on the green space account. OK, that's helpful. Bruce Wilson, did you want to add to that? It figures, but... Um I wonder if uh, local authorities that have less provision for biodiversity expertise within um, within that local authority possibly wouldn't be as inclined to spend as much money on that area because they don't have people internally making those arguments. And again, that, that area has been cut quite heavily. So it could be a workforce issue as well, Mr. Wilson, in, say so, in, yeah. in, in terms of that. Th that that's interesting. OK, so the, the, the pitch is there. Let's have this Transformation Innovation Fund. Earlier on, we were talking about uh, should this build resilience with uh, friends of groups? Should it create new groups where there's gaps? Should it be for community transfers? There's a whole variety of things it could be for. So we'll leave that sitting. But um, there's a kind of joint obligation there in relation to government at a local level and, uh, and Scottish government. So just so we are clear in relation to what the call is for, would this be a standalone fund that would be created by the Scottish Government, that individual groups would bid for, or local authorities would bid for? Would it be partnership funding between Scottish Government and local authorities agreed by COSLA, where they both put in monies? Would it be distributed at a local authority level? Just At some point, we will be doing budget scrutiny. There's an ask there, so any information you want to give in relation to that ask, I think we would find helpful. It's probably come to yourself, Julie Proctor, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, we'd be very keen to come back with, with a fleshed out proposal. In terms of the thinking around the Innovation Fund, um, currently running at the moment with Nesta, the, um, the National Agency for Innovation and Heritage Lottery Fund and Big Lottery Fund, they have a Rethinking Parks programme, um, which is UK wide, which is two million for looking at new models for parks. Scottish authorities, Scottish partnerships can apply. It's only two million. The amount of money that's going to come to Scotland from that is probably quite limited. But there's a lot of good practice that could come from that innovation fund. And it really draws on our experience of working with local authorities and with friends groups on what we call pioneer projects. It's ways of doing things differently with the resources and capacity that you've got, but finding a bit of space to think about different ways of doing that. So for instance, we did it in Aberdeen, looking at how 
what would this management look like if we thought about how we're going to manage to mitigate and adapt to climate change? We've looked in other areas at how could we um, increase the amount of lo local food growing through managing our green space in different ways. So I think it is to start pioneering some of those new approaches, and particularly around energy that we're looking at at the moment, which has the potential to actually bring income back into our green spaces. But critically, I think, for community and friends groups as well, because it's something when Green Space Scotland was a core funded charity, core funded by Scottish Government, we used to run networking and training activities for community groups. We don't have the resource to do that just now. And so what you're seeing is there are small umbrellas coming together in Edinburgh, where they bring the friends of group together. Glasgow's just starting to do something similar. But there isn't really that support group out there for friends and community groups. So again, that would be something we'd look at. But we'll take the invitation to come back to you with more detail. And just again, just on um, other MSPs can come in, but this is just in relation to, to, to budget scrutiny. We've heard a lot about public health. Mm -hmm. We've got integrated health and social care, integrated joint boards across the country. That's a different budget line. This committee doesn't necessarily scrutinise that budget line, although we give reference to it in terms of monies that transfers from health into lo effectively local authority directed spend in, in terms of care. But are we missing a trick in how we, we look at some of those monies as well? So any in, any in, uh, Dr Lowther, I don't know if you've got a comment to make in relation to that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that whole um, debate about the preventative spend is, is pretty fundamental to this. Um, so, you know, people like my organisation who work in public health will obviously argue that um, if we can move the money away from um, or move money into prevention, then obviously that's going to have longer term benefits, which will save the NHS money in the long term. Getting the evidence around that is, is quite difficult sometimes. Um, and that's a, a challenge for us. I, mean, I, I think there are some things that, that the NHS can do. So, for example, we are part of a programme called um, Green, in the Ex Green Exercise Partnership. So it's a partnership between the NHS and Scottish National Heritage and Forestry Commission Scotland, where we are trying to um, bring together funding from the NHS, um, Scottish Government and those other organisations to basically green the, NHS, green the NHS estate. For a whole range of, 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 of outcomes. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's, there's definitely things we can do and the, the, there are things in that process. That's helpful. Uh, Julie Proctor. Yeah. I know when the Environment Committee was scrutinising the budget, they did look and see that, um, that the environment delivers a wide range of benefits which create cost savings for other areas. Health, obviously, was one that was mentioned and they were looking to make that budget connection. So I think that's something we'd be keen to encourage you to do. I think in terms of the the health service, um, there is some good practice happening out there. We're just working at the moment with NHS Lothian to produce what will be the first green space and health strategic framework. And that is, again, something that we should be looking to encourage. So not only is this around how do we use existing green spaces to improve people's health, but also the role of the health service estate. We talked about the fact that local authorities weren't the only managers of land. So how do we use the NHS estate to deliver health benefits? So that kind of health promoting national health service. Now, I've got a lot of indications of various witnesses wanting to speak, so I'll roll together the last budget-related point, and then you can choose to answer it, ignore it, but effectively it's your opportunity for a final comment before we, we close the session, if you choose to have it. Mr Gibson mentioned uh, real basic things about uh, green space, irrespective of how it's defined, and that's in relation to whether grass is cut, whether the litter is picked up and in relation to dog fouling. I'm sure they could go and look at, look at a variety of other things. So in Glasgow, that would be the budget given to land and environmental services, for example. Should we be looking at some kind of crossover in relation to how local authorities prioritise those kind of things and satisfaction with access to green and blue space and see if there's a connectivity there in relation to budget lines to see if there's a strong evidence base to say, well, local authority X has cut in this area and unsurprisingly satisfaction has dipped and so we can start to look at the budget numbers based on outcomes for our constituents rather than argue over whether you know, what the number is itself but actually the outcomes for people so that was the, my, my final cut of how we embed a bit of budget scrutiny uh, this early in, into the process you can answer that you can ignore all of that that's up to you I think we'll we'll go round the table but I think we'll start with Mr Wilson actually because I, I saw you first raising your hand to speak I yeah, uh, really agree with Julie's point about the Eclair committee and, and their kind of statements on the on the budget um, also just add in to that that health uh, side of things is kind of about um, 
not just quantity of life, but quality of life. Um, we had a little chat beforehand, and that's that definitely um, agree that you know you might just be prolonging someone's life, but if you can actually improve mental, physical health through green space, that's that's uh, as well as saving money, a kind of better overall outcome. Um, I think when it when it comes to um, when it comes to budgets and how we kind of define success, it, obviously um, constituents are hugely important, but we've got to look at other indicators as well. So um, look at our biodiversity metrics, look at um, you know the amount of runoff that's coming off, look at the urban heat island effect, um, all those things as measures of success of our green space and not, and not just kind of public perception, because those things are hard to see as a member of the public. Okay, thank you. So this everyone's final opportunity to make a comment. So we'll just go around, Mr. O'Kane. Yeah, it was, just, it was just really the again in budget the potential of budgets. I mean, we've got a, a green space in Dunfermline where we've had money from one council department uh, for for a cycleway, uh, which has been put into the green space, and we're getting money from the Scottish Environment and Protection Agency for river restoration. So I suppose again, it's back to saying that. These are these are multifunctional assets. We should see our green spaces as, and you know, for something like the transport system or reducing flooding. So, I think if we can see them more than just recreation spaces, then they become really, you know, really vital in the communities. Yep, a theme there, similar to what Mr. Wilson was saying as well. Hey, John Kerr. Uh, two two points to make if I can. Um, one of them is picking up on the point that Mr. Gibson made that it's, it's not just we, we've talked about the quality of green spaces. It's not just about all the things that make them good, but what is it that stops people using them? Is it litter? Is it dog fouling? What are the things that can be improved to try and make them more interesting for people to go to? Um, the second point is that the the plea from the the friends of groups, you know, there are a lot of community volunteers out there really willing and keen to help, but they, they don't know how to do it in a lot of ways. You know, they need the links within the councils to be able to guide them in the right direction, to give them advice and so on. So, you know, we, we need to have the resources there and make sure the funding's there to be able to provide that across all of the, the urban areas and, and beyond. Um, you know, but not, not just in the, the areas where there are currently friends groups, but going beyond that as well to get more groups set up. Okay, that's helpful. Julie Proctor? Yep. I think encouraging an asset-based approach to our green space and to our parks so that we're valuing them in terms of the services they deliver, whether that's services for people and health, whether it's services in terms of the environmental element, reducing flooding, climate change and so on, and putting them onto local authority books as an asset based on those services rather than as a liability based on cost of maintenance and then focusing on quality and looking at what is the return on investment, the benefit of preventative spend through investing in green space. Hey, Dr. Lula. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, clearly there's a robust amount of evidence that shows green spaces are good for our health, so we're particularly concerned um, with the evidence that shows green space quality is declining. Um, particularly in the most deprived areas, as I said, we are particularly concerned with health inequalities. Um, so we're really interested in things that can widen, uh, sorry, t t that can narrow health inequalities, because Scotland has some of the widest health inequalities in Western Europe. So the good news is that green space is evidence that green space can actually help deliver that. So I think it's 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 a pretty significant area f in, in in respect to health inequalities. So. What you were saying, convener, about um, this committee perhaps scrutinising one particular aspect, I would encourage you to look at how you increase or improve the quality of green spaces, not just green spaces, but places in the most deprived areas, because as I say, there's significant evidence to say that that can really have a potential impact on health inequalities. Okay. Thank you. And Colin Rennie. Yeah, just a final point of a may. I mean, I, I think as the committee might expect, we dealt with many of the challenges today, but Notwithstanding that, uh, I, during the course of my work across Scotland, do get the opportunity to visit many parks. We have wonderful, wonderful assets. They're underused. We, you know, it is a challenge to encourage far greater use of that. But in terms of the budget thing that we're focusing on last, I would again commend our research to look at the value of them in a completely different way, both uh, economic and in terms of health and well-being. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rennie. That, that, that's the last word on behalf of witnesses. I have to say, a lot of crossover there. At least two other committees will be looking at very similar things. So, 
I'm sure we will do more work on this. We're going to have to think very carefully how we position ourselves in relation to that work, I think. Another really useful round table. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. I think we get good value for money from those discussions. Uh, so that ends Agenda Item 2. And we're now move to Agenda Item 3, which uh, I think we've previously agreed to take in private. So we're now move into private session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.